So I'm pleased to introduce to you Dr. Nancy McNamara, pediatric epileptologist, assistant clinical professor, and co-director of the Epilepsy Surgery, Surgery Program at C.S. Mott Children's Hospital, University of Michigan Health. She is a great friend and supporter of the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan, serving as one of the professional advisory council members. So with gratitude, presenting today on optimizing your telemedicine visit, I am honored to welcome Dr. Nancy McNamara. Welcome here. Um, so, uh, so nice to see all of you. Um, chances are I'm probably not your child's pediatric epileptologist or your pediatric epileptologist. I am, I currently work at the University of Michigan, uh, and some people in the audience might not even quite understand the difference between a pediatric neurologist and pediatric epileptologist, as many of my non-medical family members, uh, don't. Uh, so it simply just means that we went through additional training to treat patients with epilepsy. I work at the University of Michigan. I've always worked at the University of Michigan. I went to medical school at the University of Michigan. So my experience is solely here. Uh, it's a place that I love and feel very passionate about working at. Um, I am one of 20 pediatric neurologists at University of Michigan and about half of us uh, have extra expertise in epilepsy. And I, and I say that because I think it's important to know the standpoint at which I'm coming to you as we talk about how to optimize your virtual visit. The other dis disclosure is that I am absolutely not an expert in virtual health uh, or telehealth. Uh, I actually had to do a little bit of research to give this talk. However, similar to many of you in the audience, you kind of got thrown into this world a couple of years ago, and now we're all sort of our own experts in our, in our own areas uh, because of the pandemic. So the other relevant or not relevant disclosures um, is that uh, we're currently uh, setting up a device trial in teenagers at the University of Michigan, so not really relevant to this talk. And I also get $50 a year for updating the febrile seizures uh, article on MedLink, which I then donate back to our residents. So what is telehealth? Didn't even, didn't even know the basics here, so I had to do a little research. But telehealth is actually, it's everything that you do that's not face-to-face. -face. So it's using your tablet or your computer or your phone to look at your child's labs or to uh, look at your last note that you sent to your pediatric neurologist and then the message that you received back. It's that follow up information that you got about the next medicine that you might be starting. So all of that actually is encompassed by telehealth. Virtual visits is just one component of it. Because I'm not an expert, I will use these interchangeably. But mainly I looked at the question of this talk based on that virtual visit. So prior to 20, March of 2020, I have to say, I actually only had one patient who I saw virtually. And this is a patient from the Western Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So the family had to drive 10 plus hours to see me. And we had to see each other pretty frequently because he in fact has a rare epilepsy syndrome. And it took, I think six months of crazy amounts of paperwork and credentialing for me to be able to see him. And what we would do is he would actually have to go to his pediatrician's office, get set up, then log in with their specialty computer system there. And then, and then I would have to do the same thing with me. I would actually have to take like a half day and just set up to see this patient who was definitely worth it. It's so silly to think that I had to do that. That was 2019 uh, that I was doing that with this patient, where now it seems like it's just something acceptable that we all do. But there was tons of paperwork that we had to do beforehand, a lot of credentialing issues, a lot of insurance reimbursement issues because it was felt that this was an inferior way to see patients. Um, however, as we all remember pretty vividly, uh, that all changed in March of 2020. And I didn't know this until I looked it up. It was two months where we could not see patients physically unless it was something really essential. And I would guess that most of the people on this webinar have 
children or our patients with who couldn't really go two months without speaking to their doctor or seeing their doctor, a medication change needed to be made. And it was actually essential, but it was very, it was a very tricky world that we were living in. And so things changed very rapidly. I would imagine that whatever state you're in now, if it's not Michigan, you guys had very similar orders. And all of a sudden our world was flipped upside down on multiple levels, but this is just one of them. So very quickly, uh, I look back at my schedule, it was within days, uh, the University of Michigan and everywhere else that you're being seen or we're seeing at, being seen at the time, the infrastructure just completely went from virtually non-existent to just completely expanded. So all of a sudden our schedules switched and our patients were switched over to virtual visits. We were sort of scrambling at the best protected way to see patients virtually on their iPhones, what kind of links and what kind of uh, video devi devices and, and, and structures we were going to see them with. And it very much felt like we were scrambling. So you guys probably felt that at home if you were being seen at the time in our clinics uh, and we were feeling it too, but it was what was best. We needed to see our patients, they needed to see us and we didn't really have time to lose. Um, we were all very worried that our patients weren't going to be able to be seen, that we weren't going to be able to make the decisions that they needed as far as aggressive treatment goes, and that they were going to end up in the hospital or ERs um, with things that were potentially preventable. So it's still kind of true. It's not that we don't know what we're doing. We really kind of, I don't know, I felt like I didn't know what I was doing at the beginning. It was very hard for me to know how to do a physical exam on a patient virtually or, you know, how, how to do these things. I think families felt that way too. We know so much more now, but I have to say when I tried to do some prep work for this talk and look in the literature, there, there's a significant lack in the literature of how best to optimize a telehealth visit. Um, so, but I did my best. And I also, I think I have a lot of experience now as do my colleagues who I was speaking with before I did this talk. And so this is a conglomeration of, of, of what we think overall, um, some, some tips and tricks and, and sort of uh, setting the, the ideas in our heads of, of what to expect from these virtual visits. So and importantly, it's not going away, right? Virtual visits, honestly, thank goodness, are here to stay and are, I think, one of the few positives that came out of the pandemic. I love the flexibility that this has allowed us, both our patients uh, and ourselves. And I looked at a couple of talks that we've been given recently, um, the first half of this year, to see how many visits not just in pediatric neurology, but across our institution, which I think you can extrapolate to other institutions, how many are virtual visits and it's somewhere between 20 and 47% of visits. Like that's a lot of one physician's visits or us pooled as a group uh, that have gone virtual. And I think that that's an okay way that we've, that we've transitioned. There aren't a lot of guidelines to follow yet. We're getting some of these, um, but, but like, for example, how, how often is it acceptable to have a virtual visit? Uh, should it be every other visit, every third visit, once a year? I, 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 could it be every visit? Do you really need to be seen, you know, face to face with your physician? It's, there's no, not a lot of guidelines because it's very patient specific, right? And it's physician specific too. It depends on what, what you're treating. Um, so that's why it's hard to kind of make guidelines broad. In general, Many institutions don't do new patient visits or don't recommend new patient visits to be virtual. I think, again, it depends on what you're talking about. Um, for us in pediatric neurology and pediatric epilepsy, most of the time we want to meet that child and take and, and physically examine the patient um, personally before we move to, to more virtual. So most of us reserve those slots for return visits for when you already establish care. Um, but there are some institutions, I know this, that will offer um, new patient appointments, virtual or even remote second opinions. And again, some of my sleep medicine colleagues will do new patient appointments virtually, but usually in pediatric neurology and pediatric epilepsy, that's not 
typically, again, it's not even recommended or anything like that. It's just, we don't, we tend to not feel very comfortable with that because we really need to get to know this patient, this family uh, and lay hands on them to examine them. But again, I think it's okay to say that this is one positive that came out of the pandemic. I personally love the fact that I no longer have to take a half day off of work to take my child to see their specialist. I very much value that specialist and I love what they have to say, but it has made my life a lot easier to not have to always go into the, to the clinic to, to meet that person. Um, and, and I think a lot of families feel that way. So some positives that have been well established. So this is the, the kind of thing that I actually could find in the literature is that it definitely saves time and money without a doubt. Uh, think about the families who uh, are a little bit more strapped for cash, every, especially with gas prices right now, coming to see me from nine hours away. I mean, that's enough to break many families, right? So having that flexibility is fantastic and it really does save time and money um, and people's jobs <laughs> including. It allows for more flexibility. Um, again, with families, family dynamics, having somebody else to watch the other children who could instead just be playing in a different room rather than um, bring brought all the way to clinic or maybe not being allowed to come to clinic because depending on the, the rules of the clinic during the pandemic. Um, and I'd have to say one area that has been really helpful is some patients that I thought I knew them. And then now that I see them virtually, I feel like I know them on a very different level because I'm able to watch them play. They're not so fearful of being in the clinic setting. Um, some of my favorite visits are when I'm just watching a toddler like play in their playroom and they're making food at their kitchen and I'm watching them toddle from one thing into another. That's something that I could never do in clinic. They would just sit there, you know, fearfully of me, developmentally appropriately, <laughs> fearfully of me. Uh, on their parents' lap. So it's it, sometimes it's actually really, really helpful. But negatives, um, it's a lot less personal. Um, that's why I, I personally love it when I use this for people who I already know pretty well. Um, but it's, there's just, there's, we all know this, right? We've lived in a Zoom world now for over two years. There's just something about being face-to-face -face with, with, a, with a physician and with a family those pauses that you have in conversation, either like, because I didn't hear you or I'm pausing because I disagree with what you're saying or whatever. It's just, it's so much more artificial when, when it's in the virtual realm or you infer things from pauses that were actually not really true. So just that on that personal level, it's just, it's very different. Connectivity issues. I have in-laws who live in the Eastern UP. They will never be able to do a virtual visit probably for the next 10 years. And so some families just, this isn't available to them. And I think we need to be mindful of that too. So uh, I was talking this out, you know, in preparation to give this talk to everyone else in my family who's all non-medical. And I was surprised to find out because this has been my life for the last 15 years or so, that my siblings who see physicians pretty frequently, they have no idea the structure of a, of a physician visit or a clinician visit. So I actually think that this became an important part as I worked this talk up to actually just explain to you, especially for, let's say, a, a routine follow-up visit that you're having with your pediatric neurologist, what are, what's the structure in, in the physician visit? My sister was explaining to me this week and she's like, I don't know, I just like go and I have my concerns and they like do their thing and then I try to bring them up at some point. And I was like, oh no, 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 Karen, like that's not how this is supposed to go. It's actually quite structured in our minds. You maybe don't feel that, but you actually should know that it's quite structured in our mind. In a clinic visit, you typically get ushered in and vital signs are taken like weight, heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure. You're you don't really have that in a virtual visit form. Um, it's wise to have an updated weight, especially on a child who's grown a lot. Um, but but that part's missing. And then it, the first part of a visit is actually supposed to be pretty open ended. So what's been going on? What are your concerns today? Like catch me up to speed. So that's actually how a physician's visit is supposed to start. But I know that it doesn't always feel that way. 
then the physician, if it hasn't already come up, is supposed to review medications and any side effects from medications, what labs have been done or other tests have been done recently. Next portion is actually typically the physical examination, which is limited, but not obsolete in virtual visits. And so obviously I can't listen to your heart and your lungs, but I can do cerebellar testing. I can have you run around. I can see your strength to some extent. Um, and then the final portion is supposed to be next steps, wrapping up, what other testing is going to, to happen. Another thing that I think we all know that a lot of families come in, they know the things that they want to discuss. Um, but I don't know that people know this, that actually physicians actually prep and clinicians prep a lot beforehand. So I actually do this the night before or the day before, usually the night before after my children have gone to sleep, I sit down and I go through each patient. Um, and it's actually huge. I can't just jump into clinic. And I think the vast majority of physicians that I've met with and trained with, everyone preps beforehand. We're always thinking about our patients beforehand. Um, so how do we prep? I think all of us are a little bit different, but I, I'm at the point where I see too many patients that for the most part, I can't actually remember the last visit until I read my note that I've written. Cause you know that all doctors write notes after we see patients either virtually or in person with the details. And we send this to the pedi pediatrician or primary care doctor. So I remind myself of that note and of the details. I look as best I can at all of the interval phone notes, secure patient messages. For some patients, this is 100. For other patients, it's just one or two. Very importantly, another thing that my non-medical family was revealing to me is people think that we have access to other hospitals records. Like if I go to an ER down the road or an urgent care down the road, for the most part, don't just think that your physician knows that. A lot of times we don't because despite the fact that it's 2022, not all systems are connected. And that's completely above my head why that's not a thing yet, but it's just not. So there's a great hospital down the road that I oftentimes share patients with um, in Detroit. And I have to ask, I have to reach out to the physicians myself or have the family actually get the records for me because for whatever reason, our, our systems don't share. It's pretty frustrating for you. It's really frustrating for us too. And so be kind to us and, and catch us up to speed as to what's been going on. If I have a patient and I primarily take care of children with intractable epilepsy, so refractory epilepsy, uh, I, if it's my one patient with an SCN8A mutation, I look up the literature and try to up to date myself with anything that's been going on recently. Um, so that I'm well prepared to say, should we be changing anything? Should we, are there any adjustments that need to be made during our visit? And then oftentimes I have a little bit of a plan outlined. You know, if they're doing well, this is what we're going to do. If the child's still having seizures, this is what we're going to do. And then, you know, we all have our little plans of, okay, update your seizure action plan, update, uh, you know, when's the next follow-up visit? Uh, the child is over 12 and a, and a girl, so we have to make sure they're on folic acid. So we all have like these little things in our heads that we're clicking off. So I think a physician visit seems like a lot because it is a lot. There's a lot to review. And to do everything thorough is actually sort of impossible. It was a realization I came to in medicine when I was in, in medical school that, oh my goodness, I, it, I actually cannot go into every detail of every little thing. Like I can't, I was notorious for taking too long with, with visits when I was in, in training. And a lot of trainees are because it's just so much and we all wanna be thorough, but you actually can't get to everything. So bringing me to the other point that my siblings were explaining to me, I said, so do you guys have any idea how long a typical physician visit is? My sister was like, no, I don't know. like." Sometimes it feels like five minutes. Sometimes it feels like it's as long as we need. Um, it's incredibly variable. So it's somewhere between 20 minutes and 45 minutes for a return visit. And this is variable again for things that are completely over my head as to why. And it doesn't have to do with the complexity of the patient or how sick they are. It actually is just dictated, I don't know, by insurance and the administration of wherever you where you live. So 
I think that's a good thing to ask your physician. How long do we have today? You know, because it's really important. And this is the thing I'm going to keep stressing is it's really important to make sure that what you want to be covered is covered. I think most of us feel that way as physicians. We need to make sure that we've satisfied those needs. You know your child or yourself the best. Um, we cannot go through details of everything and sort of get to it without you sort of revealing it to us sometimes. Um, so anyway, so, so 20 minutes, sometimes 20 minutes is enough, but usually for somebody who's on this call, somebody with a rare epilepsy syndrome or refractory epilepsy, probably 45 minutes is barely enough, would be my guess. So breaking that visit into steps, so that kind of open-ended interval history portion, this is how I think about it. I say, okay, so Susie, how is she doing? How frequently is she, she having seizures? What types of seizures is she having right now? Are these similar? Are these the three types that I know she has? Or has she had anything new? Do, do they look the same? So again, I can't actually ask I won't have time to ask all of these questions pointedly. So feel free to say, Susie has had four seizures since our last visit. Um, they all look the same, except there was one that like lasted longer and it really scared me. We had to use a rescue medicine. So, so I think many people, especially as you're, you've had a child with intractable epilepsy or rare epilepsy syndrome, we've been taking your child to physicians for a while. You know some of these things, you become it just becomes intuitive what you're going to talk about. But for other people who are earlier in the journey, um, it's actually hard to know what to talk about. So these are just some guidelines. Um, and then, okay, so we increased the medication B last time. How did that go? Any side effects? Did that improve things or not? I have some children, it's very hard to quantify how many seizures they have. So we quantify things with how often are you using rescue medicine? So, so having that handy with you uh, for vi virtual visits is, is really, really helpful. What else is going on? But I say at any point in time, and I think all physicians are similar, you just say what your concerns are. I love it when people send me a heads up a day, a couple hours, a week beforehand. Susie is like not doing very well. I know that we made these changes last time, but I really wanted to talk about we need to we need to we need need to make a big change. I want every visit to be happy and great and for people to be doing better, but I, that's actually not the world that we live in. We have worse weeks, we have worse months, and so I just I love it when people give me a heads up about what we're going to talk about. So feel free to do that to your physician too. I know no one who finds that to be annoying. It's usually fantastic. Um, and very importantly, there's not enough time for a physician to ask you every pointed question, nor should they leave it open. Say, what, what are your concerns today? What, what, do you, what direction do you want this conversation to go in? So make sure that we're prioritizing what's important to you. Just speak up. And again, it goes back to this like artificial conversation that feels a little awkward in virtual visits, which I think is the thing that most of us had the hardest time getting over actually, or getting through is, I can't actually tell sometimes how you're doing, right? Sometimes I can't even see the patient's face on the video. Like I can't actually tell. I won't know how you're doing or what you want to talk about until you bring it up. So just talk up. Don't feel bad about interrupting the physician. So the next portion of the virtual visit or visit uh, is talking about medications and labs. So super handy when you know what medications your child is taking and what times and the amounts. That's so helpful. Um, make sure to have a list with you. Um, that works out really, really well, rather than having to walk to the kitchen in the middle of the video visit to get the six containers of meds and then bring them back. You know, just jot them down or have them right there in front of you before the visit. It's important to talk about all of the medications around, especially anything new or things that have changed, especially if those are medicines used for depression or anxiety, uh, for in inattention, or if there have been a change in your child's hormonal uh, medications. Those are all really, really helpful, especially when you're on anti-seizure medicines. This is when I typically review lab tests. Um, and what's kind of nice about this telehealth world that we're in is oftentimes you see the labs, sometimes even before I do, um, depending on how frequently you check your patient messages on your phone. 
So making sure that you've reviewed them and, and I've reviewed them is really important in any other interval labs or any or interval tests that have occurred. Um, and then what has been adjusted or changed? Have you noticed any side effects? Um, and then, okay, your hemoglobin was a little bit low on this last set of blood work we got two weeks ago. When do we need it, a next check? So that's usually when I do my decision making. But importantly, there is not enough time. This is the same phrase I just used. There's not enough time for physicians to ask each question directly. So prioritize what's most important. Oh, you, Nancy, you gl glossed over this really important thing that I want to talk about a little bit more. I have insomnia from my Lamotrigine after you increased it. Let's talk about it a little bit more. It's kind of a big deal to me. I can't sleep at night. The next step of a physical exam, which is, again, the challenging one in the virtual world, a little bit easier for us in pediatric neurology who do a lot of observational uh, neurological examination is the physical examination. So one thing that I never would have known, wouldn't have been a really you know, top of my mind thought before the pandemic is to have an updated weight. It is so helpful to have an updated weight, especially if you have a child, uh, especially if that child is growing. And we, as many of you know, we dose medications based on weight. So I have no idea and I can't tell if your child has gained weight visually. So having an updated weight is really, really helpful. Infrequently, at least in my world, do I need uh, updated vital signs so I don't need people to go get blood pressure cuffs or things like that. Um, we'll, we can, we'll usually talk about that beforehand if we need something like that. But usually in pediatric neurology, we don't usually actually care about, we care about it, but we don't need an updated blood pressure uh, or heart rate or respiratory rate. So people do not need to go out and buy uh, blood pressure cuffs. Then a general examination. How is the child looking? Have they gained weight, lost weight? Um, have any rashes, things like that. And then the neurological examination. This is the one where we'll oftentimes play games with the kids on screen. Okay, can you do some jumping jacks? Can you do some push-ups? Or it's a toddler and we just want to watch them interact with their grandmother playing on the floor. Again, sometimes those are some of the best exams I've gotten because it's because it's at their house. But there is definitely limitations. I can't check reflexes, things like that. I can't assess important things like the tone of a muscle uh, during this kind of a, a visit. So next steps um, is usually the last portion of the visit is talking about next steps and outlining a plan. So usually by this point, my patients and I already know the plan, right? Because we've kind of just talked through what their concerns are. Seizures are doing well or know they've worsened, uh, know they're having side effects to this medicine or know things are doing better, or actually the most important thing in our life is that mom and dad just split up and now we're adjusting to having two sets of, two, two sets of medications at both houses, you know, help us figure out how to troubleshoot the best ways to do that. Or my 14 year old, I thought I could trust them to take medicine, but come to find out they kept forgetting it every other night. And that was the reason for the breakthrough seizure. So whatever it has been, but it's very specific to that child. Um, and then we usually do refills, talk about upcoming tests or labs. And then very importantly for anyone who's on this webinar is to have an updated seizure action plan and knowing what that updated seizure action plan is, uh, having it printed or sent to you in a, in a printable fashion through the patient portal um, are all recommendations. And then talking about the next visit. So this comes to, me, comes to, the, to the final portion of this talk, which are tips and tricks. So this is more of things that we've learned that go really well, uh, maybe things that don't go really well. So who is telehealth or video visits good for? Uh, long distance relationships. So my pa patients in the Upper Peninsula of, of Michigan, this works very, very well for them as long as they have reliable internet access. But even those who don't have reliable internet access will oftentimes go to a, a friend or family member's house to do their virtual visit from there rather than drive nine hours to see us. Because uh, sometimes you just don't need to do that. Um, very helpful if your child is sick or lots of other people are sick and we're worried about communicable diseases like during this continued ongoing pandemic which hopefully is coming to an end soon uh, so really helpful i'd never really people just used to ca cancel when their child was sick now they don't necessarily have to cancel we can still have the visit but now you don't have to drudge your poor sick 
kid to the hospital and then run the risk of infecting other people. So I, I think that that's a, a big plus. Um, it's also really ideal for when things are going well. Believe it or not, sometimes people stop having seizures and you just sort of do a check in every six months or a year just to make sure you know, medications can get renewed. We have a seizure action plan. We see each other so that we remember each other. So that if something happens, you know, we're familiar with each other. So when disease is stable, it's actually really, really helpful. Um, inclement weather, I live in Michigan. Sometimes there's a snowstorm, whether or not it's predicted or predicted on the wrong day. And it's, I don't mind when patients just call in and say, it is not safe to drive. Can we switch to a virtual visit? Of course you can. Please don't come in and get hurt, right, driving in. Um, so I think that that's another area that this is going to be continue to be used. And since this is upper Midwest, I think all of us are in that boat. Uh, sometimes we just get snowstorms. But I still, I have to say, I still don't know the ideal frequency for telehealth or virtual visits. So at least have that conversation with your physician about what makes sense. It makes sense to come and see me in the summer. It makes sense to bundle the visit with me the same time you're you know, driving all the way down for an EEG, uh, for specialized blood work or for another appointment, that's when it makes sense. But um, I don't know the, the ideal frequency for telehealth or virtual visits. And I don't think anybody does. But when is it not ideal? I would say, if you want me to check out something on your child's body, you're worried that they're no longer walking the same way that they were before. Um, they're no longer even talking the same way that they were before. There's been a decline. I would say do your very best to do an in-person visit for that. It just, I'm able to check things better. I'm able to be more thorough. And there's just something different about being able to lay your hands on a child and, and looking at everything very, very thoroughly. It's not ideal when you have connectivity issues. Um, I feel so sad every time I'm not able to connect with a patient when we're supposed to because the internet doesn't work. And absolutely, sometimes things just happen, but sometimes things are a little bit predictable, right? Um, so if you're having issues with your internet, go to somebody else's house where it's working or, um, I don't know, Starbucks. Or, no, maybe not Starbucks. That's not where you won't have those issues, but um, I've had, especially in the middle of the pandemic, people would try to, to virtually log in and not only did their internet not work, but we also couldn't even do a phone visit. And it was just not a waste of people's time, but it was just sad because I couldn't give them the care that they needed. And when it's predictable, please maybe, you know, come in in person. And very importantly, if you don't feel comfortable with a virtual visit, don't do virtual visits. It's not for everyone. Um, if, I've had patients say that they're hard of hearing and they just, there's just like too much going on and they just, they need to focus. Um, they really don't like being seen virtually. Don't just come in and, and be seen in person. That's completely fine. This is from, again, the, the little research I found on this, which was make sure, and this is a no brainer, but it's not a no brainer before you do it the first time. Download whatever application you need on your device, on your phone, on your computer beforehand. Sometimes I don't understand electronics or computers. And the first time I did my own virtual visit with my son, it took me like a day to set it up. So I don't know why. I don't know why it took me a day. I don't know why it took so long, but I've heard this from other people who maybe are not as technologically savvy, just like me. Just make sure you have all of those things beforehand. And most of the time you can actually get on your device. Um, you can kind of tell if you're ready or not. Um, also have your password close by so that if you get logged out, you can get logged back in. And that's about as much as I can help you with that because I'm so not good at technology. I would say if you have a few minutes, write down your questions beforehand. Sometimes we get talking and you forget those questions. It's so much better to have things written down and especially your priorities for that visit beforehand. Don't let me distract you. Another tip, I said this before, but weigh yourself or your child or you know whoever the patient is before the visit so that you have it. Uh, I don't mind when people take the child and the laptop that we're using over to the bathroom to weigh themselves, but that was like three minutes we could have been talking about something else. So 
now that would be a tip, uh, which would be way everybody beforehand, whoever needs to be seen beforehand. And then fourth is know your child's medications uh, and the doses that they're actually taking. Um, have it written down or have those medication bottles right in front of you. And that includes rescue medicines. Know what refills you need to. So again, I can't tell you like it's patients that I like love and have known for forever. A lot of times they're like, yeah, hey, I don't, I don't know if we need refills. I think it's because it's so easy nowadays to just send somebody a message. However, I also know how many patients call in on a Friday night or a Saturday having run out of medicine. So a lot of things that could be avoided and a lot of, um, you know, it's scary to run out of medications that your child needs for their seizures, if you can. Have your seizure log close by, send it to your, to your pediatric neurologist beforehand. Um, I don't need to see 25 pages on, on single sp space things about seizures and details. I need to know like kind of bigger overview. So if you can summarize that beforehand, that is great. So, you know, Susie had 10 seizures a day on average for two weeks, and then you increased medicine C and now it's two seizures every other day, like that's really, really helpful. If you can't summarize or you have a hard time, absolutely just, you know, have, have what you, what, show me what you do have. But if you can summarize or take it to the next level, that's incredibly helpful. I think it's hard to summarize things when it's your own child though, I have to say in general. Um, know a little bit about their frequency and duration of those seizures too. <clears throat> Some people use seizure logging apps. I have to say the vast majority of my patients don't and it, it's no difference. Um, just having some way that you log it on your family calendar, on your phone, um, on a piece of paper, uh, whatever, that's really helpful. If your child's on dietary therapy, knowing kind of a range of ketones, um, and for those of you who have children on dietary therapy, you know what I mean about that. Um, so knowing, you know, along with seizure frequency, having a ketone log as well to kind of help us put things together about if things are working or if changes the changes that we've made have been working. Also, if there are topics of interest that you want to discuss because your child has a rare epilepsy syndrome and you're part of a support group or a Facebook group, bring them up. One thing that I say here is you can give me a heads up. You can send me a message beforehand. If you bring it up and I look like I've never heard of something before, it's not because I don't care about your child. It's because sometimes I haven't heard about something until that family brings it up. Sometimes you're actually the expert in your child's epilepsy syndrome. And it's not because I don't care. It's because sometimes families, groups learn things before we do, right? And so help share that with us. So I did not have the entire list of uh, rare epilepsy syndromes because unfortunately for epilepsy, uh, there are so many genetic disorders that can cause pretty terrible epilepsy syndromes, but their support groups are just wonderful, wonderful resources of information, support for families. And I, um, I share this because I have, I have a number of patients with rare epilepsy syndromes, but one family in particular who have just been so kind. Uh, I, we made the diagnosis of her very rare epilepsy syndrome that I had never heard of when I was a trainee. And I still take care of this patient to this day. And the, you know, as soon as we made the diagnosis, I did the best research I could. The family, obviously, they're very savvy and smart, did their best research. And then we make our best informed decisions with our information together, if that makes sense. So they would hear that one medicine wasn't good for this child's epilepsy. I still to this day cannot find that in the literature. However, I very much trust some of the information that comes from support groups, like especially when a vast majority of those children say, oh, maybe steer away from this medication. Having a good open relationship with your physician, knowing that physicians do not know everything because we don't, but also being kind when you're revealing new information to us can be really, really powerful. So I give this family as an example of a family who, you know, when, when this diagnosis was made, she was one of, I think in the number of tens of children with this epilepsy syndrome. And now seven years later, there's a huge group 
a huge support group and there's clinical trials being started to, to help uh, this rare form of epilepsy. And so it's really hard for a physician to know everything unless that physician is a primary researcher in that area. But most of us, you can't be a primary researcher in, in every form of epilepsy. So sharing with us what you learn is really, really helpful. And we all want to know it. So don't get offended if we don't know it. And then just a, one last, well, second to last slide about don'ts uh, from real life things. Please don't be driving at the time of the visit. I was like baffled the first time this happened. I was like, this is so not safe. You're not even supposed to be like talking on the phone. Um, please don't just reschedule it if you can't be not driving during a virtual visit. It just doesn't work. Being distracted, that's tricky, right? A lot of us have other children. So being distracted is tricky, but um, I've had some families who I love so much. Uh, and like, they'll have like their nine-year-old leading the session because the parents are too busy still working at the time. Well, that's, I love nine-year-olds and I love talking to the kid, but we can't really get very far uh, without parents being involved in visits. Also surprisingly frequently, Families won't bring their kids to the visit. So it'll be a virtual visit. We'll do our talking and then I go to do the physical exam and find out that the child isn't actually there. They're at school. I would say check with the physician beforehand, but the vast majority of the time we, we need the kid there, not just for billing purposes, but it's really hard to get to know kids well. Um, it's easier to get to know their parents, but it's the kid who we're actually taking care of. So for the most part, the default should be that the child is there. Um, it's just hard to give good care, if that makes sense, without the child. Sometimes we'll, you know, we'll, we'll all make exceptions, or many of us will make exceptions, but for the most part, the default should be that the child is there. And they don't have to sit there the whole time, but we could go get them from their room or, you know, from their grandma or something like that during the visit. Um, try to be on time. So, especially for those of us who have 20 minute appointments, if you're 15 minutes late to the appointment, that's not very fair to only be able to give a, a five minute appointment. So when you can try to be on time uh, to appointments, try to be early. Sometimes we're running early, though I know most of the time we're running late. Um, so. so in summary, treat the visit, treat the virtual visit just like you would a regular visit, prioritize it, have your child there. But fortunately, it will be less burdensome on you uh, than, than an in-person visit where you have to drive X minutes to, to see one of us. Very importantly, just like a regular visit, speak up if you have something you want to discuss. Don't let us gloss over it. If we talk about it and you want to talk about it again, just bring it back up. You are the driver of this visit, not the physician. Know your medications and up, have an updated weight for the patient. And then share what you know and what direction you want to go to next. If I'm proposing something and I'm not re reading your face very well because it's a virtual visit and you don't love my idea to keep going up on the Lamotrigine gene because you just told me it was giving you insomnia, well then just say, you know what, maybe let's not do that. Like, can what other options do we have? Um, and um, anyway, so hopefully this gave you a little bit of insight, at least mainly based on my experience over the last two years about how to make a virtual visit a telehealth visit better. Um, hopefully, you know, it's funny because as I was preparing, it's mainly about any visit. This could be pertained to, to, to most physician visits. So feel free to extrapolate it back to that. Um, but I think in general, having this such an easier ability to do virtual visits, I think is something that is one of the rare positives that come out of the pandemic. So as long as we're utilizing them responsibly, both from a physician standpoint and from a, a patient standpoint. So I think we have a little bit of time now for- We do. Well, first of all, I wanna say thank you so much. That was really informative. It was really helpful. And I don't think I've ever had a physician give us that insight of like, here's what we're thinking about. Here's how we're structuring it. And that was so valuable to hear. So I really, really appreciated that. And it made me think it would be helpful if our doctors told us that sometimes, because um, that, that frames how I'm thinking about things too. Thank you. 
Uh, for everyone, we have some time for questions here. You can put them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And uh, we've got until 2 p.m. So we will start with questions around uh, the content that has been shared. But if we have a little more time, we might have some general epilepsy questions as well. So um, I'd like to start with this one. Um, I know you mentioned that some of your patients use seizure monitoring apps and diaries, some don't. Um, for those for whom that may be new, are there certain ones that you might recommend? I should have researched that question okay. because as I was prepping, uh, I was thinking about how interesting it was that I don't think I actually have any right now who use any apps. I very much have neurotic parents who put things into Excel spreadsheets and make me graphs. Um, I absolutely do not have any patients, at least that they share with me, any of their apps. So I can't recommend any. And that's a yeah. terrible answer as a pediatric epileptologist, but it is the truth. You know, that's okay, because I, I think also there have been, even in some of the main ones that have been used, there have been some shifts lately. So I know that the Epilepsy Foundation of America was using something called My Seizure Diary for a while or recommending that. And now they're also recommending uh, a company called Nile um, that's doing some work around uh, AI as well in um, some of these apps that can, you know, uh, help put these things um you know, it, it all in one place and give some information. So um, someone in the chat too is saying, that's me, I make the graphs. I, I think that's <laughs> and And pencil and paper is just fine too. Just I, fine. I think that comes back to me not being technologically savvy, so. <laughs> no, I think that that's exactly right. Paper is just fine. And you can sometimes get really good information um, and just that sense of, sometimes I think even slowing down and writing it down can actually be really helpful too. So that's a really good question. Uh, and you all can continue to put questions in the Q&A feature. We would love to hear your questions. And I do have another one um, that's come in. Um, you know, and of course, this is a, a sensitive topic, um, but I'm curious, you know, how do you in a telehealth visit tackle the subject of SUDEP when you need to? And I, and I know that's not probably every visit, but when that might need to come up and and how does that translate with the child present? And, I, and I'm sure that involves differences based on their age and where they are developmentally, but how has that but, gone? That's such a good question. And actually I was just part of a interest group um, just this past week where we, the researchers, I was, I was there as a, as a physician, um, but the researchers are trying to figure out guidelines for how to best counsel about SUDEP and for those of you who don't know, SUDEP is sudden unexplained death in people with epilepsy and the risk in pediatrics is very low, but it's higher as a child or patient has more convulsive seizures. We don't know why it happens and usually the seizure isn't witnessed and it just happens. And so uh, I can't speak for everyone, but I feel pretty strongly that I don't wanna talk about it if the child is present. So I actually make sure that the child isn't present or if they are present, they're not aware of what we're talking about. I also don't typically do it with the first visit with a family, just because usually when a family is visiting me for the first time for a new diagnosis of epilepsy, and again, this isn't shared by all of my colleagues, I feel like it's a little much. I give them paperwork about it um, and I give them a, a packet and one of the many things in the packet of welcome to this world of epilepsy, one of the things is about SUDEP, but usually things are just so emotional at that time, it doesn't seem appropriate. But we do review things like the rescue plan. Mm -hmm. So then when I do bring it up, getting back to your question, in a virtual visit, let's say it's the second virtual visit, you know, and I'm having this with a family, I make sure that the child is not around. Um, because I don't, I don't want them to have the same adult worries that we have. Adults have a hard enough time grappling with this. Sure. And I usually do it at the same time that I am talking about rescue medicines. And I say, you know, risk from death from epilepsy is just incredibly rare. You know, I'm prescribing these rescue medicines. I want you to be aware of when to use them. And then I usually segue into, you know, one of the reasons why we're being so aggressive about treatment of these seizures is to reduce the risk of death from a seizure, but also there's this 
entity called SUDEP where we don't know why, but a child will just pass away from their epilepsy and not even from a long seizure. And so that's how I usually do it, but I don't, I, I don't know, I, I feel pretty strongly that you shouldn't do it when a child is present yeah. just because I don't want them to have those same worries. So. Sure, and I wonder for yeah. anyone um, maybe in the chat if you feel like you know that was brought up in a way it's it's always difficult you know and, and thank goodness it is rare thank goodness um, but if that has you know how did that go for you you know if if something was comforting or helpful we would want to know <laughs> best practice um, you know to talk around tough issues like that um, another thing I'd love to ask is you know thank you so much for sharing um, that hey we love it when people give us some information ahead of time and I. I think sometimes parents or maybe even individuals when they go in to see their doctors, they might want to do that, but they're nervous of like, oh, I'm a little nervous of taking up too much space or, you know, I know there are other patients, things like that, you know, and you gave us some really good examples, but can you think of some, you know, that maybe um, as you think about, you know, the hypothetical Susie, uh, maybe sometimes when um, someone mentioned something that was just invaluable that they told you, you know, that this is really helpful, I think, for our parents to know. Um, I'm just thinking about the last week. So I have a, a family where the child has just developed intractable epilepsy. So like, you know, in the last couple of weeks, we've gotten to medication dosing where we've maxed out one medicine, it didn't work. We maxed out a second medicine, it didn't work. And we've had some discussions in the past about this is when we start to evaluate a child for epilepsy surgery. And we kind of, we didn't go into great depth, but we talked about how that requires, you know, these kinds of tests and things like that. And then I had a phone conversation and follow up when we kind of got the max dosing of the second medicine and the, and the family sent me a message before the visit and said, we're just not ready for that yet. That was actually really helpful because I would have just kept going because I actually thought until that point we were on the same page. They said, okay, we're just, we're just not ready for that. Let's talk about other things. Right. So it, it, it really, again, it's really valuable because I actually don't know what's going on in their head. Right. I would say that's the other thing that I've caught myself in the position of many times where people presume that I know what's going on at home. And I, and I don't, um and i don't know why it's so hard to tell but i think part of it is that point that i brought up at the beginning of the talk where i actually can't see notes from other hospitals most of the time i don't know that susie has gone to an er four times in the last month that's far away unless somebody communicates that to me so little heads up like that big changes in the family um things that you would want me to know. Yeah, I mean, I'm like, they're just coming through my head right now, like a child who I didn't realize was having issues with one of the parents during a divorce, because when they come to the visit, everything seems so great, but behind the scenes, they're not gonna share that kind of thing with you, um, you know, in front of Susie. Uh, they're, they can, that's something that they would only feel comfortable sending via the portal that Susie's having a really, really hard time when she's leaving her mom's house because she doesn't want to leave. And then she's having more seizures at dad's house, like things like that, that I never would have guessed. So just share them if you feel comfortable. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. And I think it personalizes too. I mean, the challenges, but also maybe if something really fun or meaningful is going on in a child's life, I'm sure that's something you'd love to know and be able to, to bring up and, and celebrate. And I think that's really wonderful. So I would like to share with everyone else, we've got about five minutes left. And uh, if you just have some general questions about epilepsy that you might like to ask a pediatric epileptologist, feel free to put those in the chat. Um, and I see one right now. Any thoughts, knowledge, or uh, insights on any new upcoming therapies for drug-resistant epilepsy? What, what's kind of new in the pipeline? Um, great, great question. Um, so there's a couple meds that are out and one specific med that just came out for Lennox Gastaut syndrome, which is a, for those of you who don't know, it's a 
form of epilepsy of which there are many different causes. So a child can have a hypoxic brain injury and end up with Lennox Gustav syndrome, a genetic cause. Um, and it's a typically intractable epilepsy. So meaning you try medications and they're still having seizures uh, and typically seizures of different types. And so that's usually for whom medications are first approved. And so there's a medication called fenfluramine uh, that was recently approved for that. We've been using it for over a year in Dravet syndrome, another rare epilepsy syndrome, but it really just came out for Lennox Gustav syndrome. So that's a new one. Um, I've used it a several times and actually children tend to tolerate it really well. The caution is that a child has to have an echocardiogram done prior to starting it and then every six months, just because there's a theoretical risk for a, a heart issues at high doses that you don't use it at. So those, that's an important thing to know. Um, one of my titles is the co-director of our epilepsy surgery program. So one of the things that we have been using and are very interested in are for children who can't have receptive epilepsy surgery. So if seizures aren't coming from one part of the brain that you can remove. Uh, there are different forms of what we call neuromodulation. So it just means like stimulating a part of the brain and it reduces seizures. Somebody figured out a long time ago that if you stimulate different parts of the brain, it re over time it reduces seizures. It doesn't make you seizure free, but it's a good option for some children. So the one form that's been around for a long time that many people know about is called vagus nerve stimulation. So it's a device that lives in your chest. There's a wire that goes to your vagus nerve and it goes off every so often. Uh, well, now there are implantable devices. Um, there are two implantable devices. One is called responsive neurostimulation and then the other one is called deep brain stimulation. Both are approved for adults. Um, but they're not approved for children. It's used off label in children. And that's one of the um, uh, disclosures that I had at the beginning is that we're planning on taking part in one of the seeing if, if it's safe to use and can use off label in children uh, age 12 to 17. We, disclosure is we've used it in children, you know, with terrible epilepsy in that age group. So, uh, so those are two really interesting things that I think we all want to see the most optimal ways to use them and, and for which patients to use those for, because it's a little bit muddy actually. Um, but again, anything to help children that doesn't cause all the side effects of medications would, would be great. But importantly, those devices don't cause your child to be seizure free. So not the first thing I would jump on, um, but more options are better. More options are better. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. I one of the things I want to thank you for is just how how empowering I think this presentation felt of that sense of like, oh yeah, you know, when we go in there, we're in the driver's seat. Um, also, here are some things that are especially helpful. You know, it, it's okay to give information ahead of time. You know, even just that learning that structure. I I don't know that a lot of us have ever known that, um, and that's helpful to know too. So. I just want to thank, oh, I see one more question down here. Let's do that and then we'll finish up. Actually, no, we're good. Okay. Um, I want to thank you, Dr. Nancy McNamara, for this really wonderful time and for these great insights. Uh, we hope everybody feels more equipped to optimize your next telehealth visit when that happens for you. And also want to thank all the participants who have been here today and taken this time to learn together. So thank you for joining us. We'll be back at 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. And our next session will be Rescue Medications and Seizure Action Plans. So we will see you then. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. And with that, a uh, final bit of housekeeping, it is time to get this started. So I want to welcome to our deep dive. So we had one deep dive earlier today from 12 to one. And this is our second one. So this is part of the feedback that we received last year that people wanted to have a little bit more time to dive deep into some of the issues and topics. And one of the topics that was suggested was actually talking about the seizure action plan and rescue medications. And so the first person that came to mind is Dr. Priya Tatachar. She's an attending physician in neurology at the Epilepsy Center at Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. And she is also on our medical advisory 
Advisory Council, and she is uh, our, my go to person for this topic. She's got a, a specialty in the rare space, and she presented on this topic uh, last summer. And I just remembered that she does an amazing job with this. And so I'm really, really thrilled to have her here. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Tathachar. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Aisha. And um, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, for talking today. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, let me know if you can see it. Perfect. Okay, very good. And um, let me do one thing here. I'm going to swap. Okay, perfect. So welcome everyone. I know it's um, five o'clock on a Monday. I'm sure um, I'm going to you have other things to do, so I'll make the stock worth your time. Um, I'm talking about rescue medications, um, and especially in um, management of epilepsy, especially in patients with um, rare syndromes or epileptic syndromes, and how useful it is to have a seizure action plan when we're, th when we're thinking of treating um, seizures or seizure clusters. The objectives of my talk is to understand seizure first aid. We'll go over a quick review of definitions uh, to understand the concept of rescue medications. What, what is the rationale behind the use of it? Uh, what are the medications we use and what's the rationale for those medications? And what is new and exciting in this field? Um, I have no disclosures, um, but I will be using brand names and pictures of medications during my talk. We'll start with the scenario and I think um, the not so uncommon scenario of either being called, you know, on an airplane, is there a physician on board to, you, you know, you're at a birthday party with, with your child and suddenly there's another kid who falls to the floor and starts having a generalized convulsion. Um, there is always, we call this panic at the disco, everybody is like screaming, there's, there's a lot of commotion. What do you do when this happens? Somebody says, give him some water. And if I had the buzzer sound, I would say no. If somebody says, put a spoon in his mouth, he's gonna chew his tongue off. I'm sure you've heard that being said before. The answer is no. And then people will say, let's hold him down. You know, he's, he's gonna hurt his head. And the answer again is no. So, we know what to do, and at the end of this talk, I'm hopeful that everybody here will know what to do as well. The first thing to do is usually easier said than done, and that is to remain calm. And those of us who've seen people convulsing or who are turning blue know that that's really hard to do when, you know, when the child is having a seizure. I'm a pediatric epileptologist, so most of my talk will be child kid, um, not to offend the adults with epilepsy, but um, most of the times, you know, when we deal with this, it's really hard to remain calm. But we know if we know what to do and we have the sequence of what to do next, I think it's easier to go about it in, in, in a sort of a sequential manner. The first thing we want to make sure is that child is in a safe area and there is nothing to hurt the child as they're having a seizure. We basically cushion the child's head to make sure that there's no um, injury or, or uh, because of the repetitive movement. We assign somebody or we start timing the seizure ourselves. We identify if necessary, is there a medication bracelet? Is there a medication chart? Is the patient having a VNS on, on a person? And we wait to see if the seizure stops by itself. When the seizure is over, we make sure the child or the person is placed in a recovery position. And the things that we don't do is don't restrain, don't put items in their mouth and do not try to feed them or have them you know, drink water during this time. Um, and this is something that is, you know, unfortunately, as parents start to see their kids having seizures, especially when they start having more than, you know, one or two seizures, it becomes easier. I mean, it's a hard thing, but it just gets easier um, as, as, as you start dealing with it more. Now, back to our kid in the play, uh, in, in, in the, um, 
uh, playground. It's been about three minutes now. How do what do we do? Someone's notified the parents. They're coming on. They're on their way. They're getting the diazepam. Um, EMS is coming. They're on its way as well. Um, people are doing, um, you know, crowd control. They're giving the child some space and your timing. The the uh, the seizure. Now let's talk a little bit about the definitions of status epilepticus. Over the last four or five years, ILAE has come up with new definitions, and I just wanted to go over what the old definition used to be. Back in the day, we would say thirty minutes of continuous seizure activity. It's hard to believe we would let them seize for thirty minutes, but thirty minutes of continuous seizure activity or two or more sequential seizures without full recovery of consciousness in between. Um, current definitions are five minutes or more of continuous seizure activity, and we're talking about convulsive seizures, or two or more discrete seizures, but no recovery of consciousness in between. That is the current definition of status epilepticus. Um, the ILA further went on to explain what is the mechanism of, of status. So normally seizures are self-limiting, and the process of the brain has the capacity to sort of stop the seizures by itself, not longer than three minutes um, for most part. However, if the seizure proceeds or prolongs longer than three minutes, there is a failure of mechanisms responsible for that termination, or there are downstream initiation of mechanisms that prevent cessation of these seizures. Unfortunately, when the seizures continue, you know, to prolong after five minutes, the consequences are on the on the brain cells or the neurons. So there is a potential for neuronal injury. There's a potential for neuronal death in, in a refractory status epilepticus. And there's also an effect of alteration of neuronal networks. A lot of studies were done on mice, specifically in um, the timing of injury. And that is how we came about that five minutes or longer, you know, if we don't stop the seizure, if it doesn't stop by itself or we don't stop it, then there is a potential for neuronal injury. And that's why we, we strive to stop the seizure within five minutes. So there's, and it also depends on different types of seizures. We're talking about five minutes for a generalized convulsion. However, we have other types of seizures. So for five minutes, we have for focal or a complex partial, it used to be called. Uh, for focal seizures, it's 10 minutes. And if it's for a non-convulsive or a abson seizure, we can go up to 15 minutes. So there's different time periods where we, we draw the line to call it status epilepticus. Now let's go back to our kid again. The parents are here. They give the rectal diazepam. It's about five minutes. And the patient, um, you know, stopped seizing after the uh, rectal diazepam. Uh, EMS comes in at the same time. They they're talking to the parents. They review the seizure action plan. Um, the child is assessed. His vital signs are are stable, but he's very postictal. So the EMS takes him. Um, to be monitored in the uh, emergency room. So this is not an uncommon situation, um, specifically for those of you who have kids with epilepsy. This is, this is not uncommon um, situation either. So that brings us to what are rescue medications? Is this, is this a situation that a rescue medication should be on person with the child, should be within you know, walking distance to wherever the child is? Um, and how do we go about uh, working that into the child seizure action plan? Now, what are rescue medications? So essentially, these medications stop um, prolonged seizures. They stop uh, status epilepticus, or we, they can be used to stop clusters of seizures or, or acute repetitive seizures or short seizures that occur within a period of time that are beyond the normal frequency for what that child would normally experience. Um, this is very individual, and it's um, based on the baseline frequency of epilepsy or baseline frequency of seizures in that particular child. So if it is over and beyond that, then it can be termed as seizure clusters. Um, again, there is no definition for seizure clusters, and it's very individual based. So. Why do we use rescue medications? Like the scenario you just, um, you, I just told you about, um, that scenario 
if the rescue medication had been available, had been given to the child in five minutes, they stopped the seizure, it could prevent progression to status. It could reduce the number of ED visits and hospitalizations. And of course, um, downstream can reduce the healthcare costs to the families as well. Um, ambulance rides are not cheap. Um, who needs rescue therapy? So when we're thinking about patients who, you know, everybody should have a rescue or a seizure action plan or a rescue plan, it should be prescribed at your first visit. If there has been a seizure longer than five minutes, there has been multiple seizures, or there's been a history of status epilepticus. If there is a history of cluster seizures, whether they cluster around periods or whether they cluster with, with um, some kind of a trigger, or there's been a history of a long febrile status or a seizures with fever that occur in clusters, or the family or the child is able to identify specific situations or triggers that can bring on um, their seizures. Every child that comes to um, the neurologist or every patient that goes to a neurologist needs to be assessed for the need for rescue therapy. Now, rescue therapy for patients we know who have convulsive seizures, who have clusters of seizures, or importantly, who have symptoms that are um, a safety concern. For example, they have desaturations, apnea, or a prolonged seizure that needed resuscitation, need to have a rescue therapy um, or a rescue plan. And if the family thinks that there is a situation or a trigger that can provoke the child seizure, it would be better to have a rescue medication on hand during these um, situations. Now, for many years, um, we had we had. I think the 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 consensus is every neurologist talks to their patient about rescue medications. However. Um, the Epilepsy Foundation's Rescue Therapy Project sent out uh, questionnaires, and it wasn't necessarily the truth. They realized there were a lot of gaps, and um, there were many stakeholders involved in the care of a child with epilepsy, not just the parents, not just the uh, neurologist. It's also the environment. It's also the workplace, the school, the school nurse. So there are many stakeholders involved in the child's care. And every patient needs or every um, uh, stakeholder needs to know what to do in case the child has a seizure. And they came up with the um, areas of agreement. And that was a uniform terminology and accepted you know, terms for um, the, the, the medical terminology for the seizures, what are the exact scenarios in which the seizure um, action, uh, the seizure medications need to be uh, administered, the education and how this needs to be administered and the individualization of treatment for each patient. And of course that boils down to an individual seizure action plan per patient um, and per situation. One, one in school, one in, day, in daycare, one in uh, after school, wherever the child may be. Now let's talk about rescue medications. What is an ideal rescue medication? Now, if you think about it, the ideal rescue medication should act right away. It should act against all types of seizures. It should act like the moment you the, the, it's administered, at least within the, a couple of minutes, it should stop the seizure. It should be easily accessible, easily stored, easily portable. It should be easily used by different people uh, with varying levels of medical literacy. It should be used um, both in adults and pediatrics and for patients who don't have seizures, but who need to have the comfort of having that um, anti-seizure medication on board, it should have a long enough half-life so you're not getting refills every two months. There are different routes that we can give medications in patients. Um, the enteral route can be oral. It could be via the G-tube or the J-tube or by mouth. Buckle is when you like leave it in the in the side of the cheek and let the um, mucosa absorb it. Could same thing with the sublingual, um, rectal, intranasal, 
subcutaneous. And we also know that um, medications are given intrapulmonary, for example, for like asthma medications, and, and definitely intravenously through an IV line. And we know that there are different factors that influence each of these medications in the child's body or in the person's body. And that depends on the age, that depends on the sex, that depends on whether the person's pregnant, old, it depends on the different types of seizures, and also on the the drug itself, the characteristics of the drug itself, how easily absorbable is it? How does it cross the blood brain barrier? What is the blood flow to that area that helps in absorption of this medication? So these are all the things that need to be taken into account when we are thinking of an ideal um, you know, rescue medication. Now, when we give a medication, 100% of it is available at 100% of the time. And that is usually done when we give it IV. This is great when the child is in the hospital and is having a seizure, during a surgery, we have access, but it's very impractical to expect to have an IV line, you know, accessible at home or accessible in an outpatient setting. Um, so we need to think of other routes of administration. Um, the gold standard of anti-seizure medication first line use rescue therapy is benzodiazepines. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what this means. Benzodiazepines are a group of medications that act on um, what we call as a GABA receptor. GABA is the gamma, gamma aminobutyric acid. This is the most common inhibitory neurotransmitter, meaning it just it, it douses the brain down, it calms the brain down. And this is seen mostly in the brain and it's seen in the limbic system as well. So what it does is it, it, it dials down the excitability of the nerve cells. And how it does that is by, um, it, 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 this is the synaptic junction. And what the benzodiazepines do is they increase the inhibitory effects of the GABA by opening the channels and they increase the frequency of the opening of the channels. So these negative ions can go in and essentially calm the, calm the nerve down. Um, the other medication that works through these GABA receptors is, is phenobarbital, which is also a very well-known anti-seizure medication, but it's just a different way that it works on the receptors. The uh, benzodiazepines are very popular medication that we use in epilepsy. Um, many of these medications are used as rescue medications. We use um, Globosam is one of the... Um, benzodiazepines that is used as a long-term medication because it's just a little bit different structurally than the rest of the benzodiazepines. And the rest of the benzodiazepines, the clonazepam, diazepam, lorazepam, and midazolam are the ones that we use very frequently as um, rescue therapy. So let's talk about what to do when we, we see a patient in status. Now, is this a patient who has epilepsy? If that's that is so, then we think about the situation. Is the patient in um, the hospital or is the patient outside in a non-emergency room setting? Now, if the patient has epilepsy, do they have a home medication on person? If they have a home medication on person, then that's the first thing that we would use. Most often, if they have diazepam rectal, intranasal diazepam or intranasal midazolam, that would be the first medication that we use. Um, we would check to see if they have a medical bracelet, if they have a VNS, then we, we go ahead and swipe the VNS. And at the same time, um, we monitor the time, we monitor to see if the seizures have stopped. And if it doesn't, we call EMS. Now, once the EMS gets there, they will check to see if the seizures are ongoing. They will check to see, you know, the, the airway breathing and circulation, the ABCs that, that we want to make sure the child is um, stable. They will try to get an IV access if the child is still seizing. Once the IV access is obtained, they, they, they check to see if the, if the baby is still seizing, they go ahead and do a lorazepam. Now, many times if the, if the child is seizing or the pe person is seizing or having a generalized convulsion, it's really hard to get an IV line, um, then there is no time to waste. So we go ahead and do an intramuscular um, um, benzodiazepine at that time. Now, 
if there is a second dose available by the time the EMT gets there, they haven't gotten there yet, it's been five minutes, the child's still seizing, then go ahead and deliver the second dose of the whole medication that is available by the bedside if, if it is available um, on person. So before the approval of um, new rescue medication in 2019, um, we had um, the consensus that said the, the most um, you know, common medications that were used were the rectal diastat. But we also knew that the buccal or intranasal anticonvulsants had a very good effect of, of uh, stopping seizures and pretty much as good as IV anticonvulsants. Um, so in, I think for the last 20 years up until the approval of the newer um, intranasal anticonvulsants, rectal diazepam was the one that was most popular and the one that was used most commonly for uh, rescue therapy. Um, this was kind of like, um, you know, the only medication that was used based on this, those two um, randomized control trials back in the, in the 90s, right? Um, and of course, um, rectal diastat, even to this day, is pretty popular, um, especially in children younger than six, for the ease of administration in those kids. Now, the most important thing about the rectal diastat that is that, um, you know, it's age-based, and it comes in a variety of, uh, of doses. It comes as something that you can dial up to the, uh, the dose that you need based on age and based on weight. And the, mo the other important thing is that it comes with an instruction manual and a video. Um, I'm not sure how many parents um, watch the video, but it's recommended that every time a rectal diastat is is prescribed to a family, there has to be a nurse or a medical professional who, you know, demonstrates how the uh, medication is used, either via a, a dummy um, a, a dose or via a video. Um, because most of the times when the child is having a seizure and it's the first time you're using diastat, it's, it's always, you know, people are very nervous to use this and it's not an easy thing to use when the child is convulsing. Um, so that's about diastat. Again, it's still the most commonly used um, um, rescue medication. Um, older kids now, we have moved away from rectal diastat and then we normally use a bridge medication called clonazepam that can be uh, used as a disintegrating tablet. You could place it under the tongue. And this medication is used to treat clusters of seizures or in, in sort of like a preventative uh, situation where you expect the child to have increased seizure frequency in the setting of an illness. The uh, issue with the rectal diazepam is, you know, Many children are acutely aware that they're different when they have epilepsy. Um, and if they've had a seizure, let's say in PE class, and they were given a rectal diazepam at that time, it's a very stigmatizing um, um, situation. Um, and, you know, of course, if the older they are, the worse that is. So for 20 years, we really didn't have an alternative. And you know, of course, parents, parents and patients themselves asked, why can't my child get a rescue medication in a more respectful way? Um, already, children suffer a lot of depression, especially knowing that they have epilepsy and knowing that they feel different already. And I think this was this was um, something to illustrate um, the situation. This brings us to other routes that we could use instead of the rectal diazepam. So we could use sublingual, like I told you, the, the uh, clonazepam. We could use the subcutaneous route, but again, it needs medical expertise. Uh, we could use buccal, which is used in Europe, and it's very easy to use and it's very effective, uh, the buccal midazolam. It's not FDA approved here. Um, the intranasal midazolam and the diazepam, uh, which are now um, mainstream and FDA approved. When we talk about cost effectiveness, um, the most cost effective medication was buccal midazolam. Unfortunately, 
it's not available yet here. Um, again, nasal midazolam was the next um, cost-effective medication that uh, we have for seizure rescue. So these are the common medications that we use and the dosing, uh, the adult dosing and the pediatric dosing here. Um, let's talk a little bit about, this is the same uh, standard pediatric doses. Let's talk about intranasal midazolam. Intranasal midazolam prior to FDA approval was being used quite rampantly, but it, it came as a, um, a two-part device. It had a, um, a, a mucosal atomizer device that we would use um, with the midazolam, and we would have to prescribe it you know, uh, to the pharmacy and they would, they would make this uh, up for the families. This was up until the FDA actually approved um, the nasolam uh, recently in 2019. So now 20 years later, we have, you know, medications that are portable, that are um, available, um, you know, the almost, I think I might have a little device if you haven't used it. They, the portable, they, they look very, very fancy. They're, you know, easy to use. Um, and this is, this is um, actually a breakthrough for most of our patients with epilepsy. Now, this is used in the treatment of um, uh, seizure clusters or acute repetitive seizures. And this is approved for 12 years and older. So it's supplied as a nasal spray. This comes with five milligrams of midazolam. And of course, um, it's recommended that you, you use uh, the spray in the nostril um, and not more than one episode every three days, but that's that's a changing recommendation, and I'll go over that in a minute. Um, the problem with this one is that some kids have um, amnesia or they have trouble recalling uh, for a few hours after we give them the medication. Um, many patients um, experience some irritation in the nose. Uh, many patients say that um, they have some headaches, but it's not very common. Um, there's always a risk of suicidality in any of the uh, anti-epileptic medications. So this comes with the same risk um, or, or warning of suicidality. So nasalam comes with a also a instruction um, booklet. Um, and it's very easy to use. And also it's easy to um, to, to uh, for the for the patients themselves if they're older to use it themselves as opposed to the rectal diazepam and the adolescents can use it um, and carry it around on person. The second medication that's that was uh, approved very exciting was the nasal um, the diazepam or the valtoco. The valtoco now was approved for six years and older. So now we have um, a younger age group that we can use uh, alternative to to rectal diazepam. Again, it is one no uh, spray um, in nostril, one or one spray in, in either nostril, depending on the age and the dose recommended. It's um, similar or looks similar to the nasalam device, and it's also similar to uh, um, the, the use. The use is similar as well. Um, again, it was safe. The, again, with the Valtoco, the most common um, adverse effect was irritation of the nose or feeling stuffiness in the nose. Many patients also said they had some headache. Um, some people, some patients really felt a, a sort of an irritation in, in the nostril and sedation. And um, sedation was the next uh, common side effect. So in, in a table format, this is the most uh, FDA approved therapies now for seizure rescue. And um, we still, I mean, rectal diazepam is still um, uh, very, very common and, and um, very easily available um, medication. But now we have other options that we can use that are more portable, that are more, um, you know, easily administered and less embarrassing to the, fam to the patient. This is a medication that was um, it has not been approved yet, but I thought it was a very cool, um, very cool. Um, I'm sorry, um, a very cool um, administration to um, you know mechanism. Oh, I'm sorry.
Okay, so the um, mechanism of how this works is is actually quite cool. It's um, um, a, it's called a staccato system. So essentially, there's like a thin film that is placed um, on a metal where you actually the heat of the breath vaporizes this um, this medication, and it's it's um, almost like um, taking a, a, a Intra, intranasal or in you know um, vapor, and um, it was used for patients with photosensitive epilepsy um, by Dr. Jackie French, who you heard earlier. But it, I don't think um, the trials were still ongoing. It has not been FDA approved yet. But I thought the the idea and the um, the thought behind this process was pretty cool. There are other things that are in the pipeline. Um, there is. Um, you know, many medications now, like alprazolam, rivaracetam, allopregnolone, these are still being uh, worked up for um, emergency use um, for seizure rescue. Uh, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about Vegas uh, nerve stimulator or VNS. There are many patients that have a VNS, especially if they have intractable epilepsy. That means if they have um, seizures uh, or epilepsy that has not responded to two or more adequately tried anti-epileptic agents, and they're considered surgical um, uh, interventions, VNS is used in many patients with um, with intractable epilepsy. The VNS is essentially, um, there is a generator that is placed in the uh, left side of, of the chest. And there's two wires that go and wrap around the vagus nerve, uh, which sends inhibitory responses, you know, and, and it works over a period of time. It is used also to stop acute seizures by swiping the magnet and, and, and inducing a, um, a therapy to be given to counter a seizure or to stop a seizure. Um, so this is important to note that the magnet should be carried on person if the patient has a VNS and can be used to abort seizures as well. Let's talk about seizure action plan. Um, like we spoke, seizure action plan is, is a very unique way of transmitting what the um, rescue medications and the rescue plan should be for every individual with epilepsy. And that can be disseminated to all the caregivers and stakeholders who take care of that child. Now, this is a, a, a medical document, and this has to be filled from um, the doctor's office with the current medications and with the uh, sequence of medications to be given to stop the seizures in that particular individual. Um, the uh, seizure action plans are to be, uh, you know, discussed with the school nurse as well, and it should be uh, updated. Actually, the most important thing is to update the seizure action plan, you know, with every change or every um, medication change um, or rescue plan treatment change that has been made and to notify, um, for example, the patient just got a VNS placed. So that has to be updated on your uh, seizure action plan as well. A copy of this can be found on the Epilepsy Foundation website. Um, this is, a, um, I think now, a, the most popular method of sort of communicating with the school, uh, what is the plan on the school nurse, what needs to be done for this child. And it has to be an agreement between the mom, the, the parents, the child, and the uh, doctor's office. Now, the other thing to think about, and I think it's really important, is tracking seizures and monitoring frequency. Not every child's seizures are is the same, even if they have, let's say, the same rare epilepsy. Um, my specialty is tuberous sclerosis. And in, in, in this is a good example. With this kind of condition, you can have uh, opposite ends of the spectrum. You can have a child with the same mutation, but can have 20 seizures a day or can have a seizure once in three months. So, you know, seizure rescue plans then will be different for, for them as well. Uh, how to track these seizures. Now, different devices are available, seizure tracking devices are available, and apps are available as well um, on the phone. And when you, when you track these seizures over the course of time, it gives us an idea of what the normal frequency is. 
And then what is above and beyond this normal frequency that needs to be treated? And this becomes important if patients have acute repetitive seizures or seizure clusters. Um, Danny Did Foundation, um, I think you'll have a talk on it tomorrow. Danny Did Foundation has this um, website and talks about all the different devices that are available currently available. And um, an Epilepsy Foundation now has a um, an experience for all the um, seizure tracking apps, seizure diaries, and this is something that you can actually can do online um, or, or, or download on your phone as well. Um, I know, Aisha, we spoke about this the last time. Um, we had a law that was passed in Illinois um, and this is um, this is very important because this is called the Seizure Smart School Act. Um, all the personnel in school need to be trained in seizure first aid. And if Aisha is here, she has done a fantastic job of going to schools, you know, far far away from you know the cities and, and educating people on what seizure first aid is. And Epilepsy Foundation has uh, um, on their website seizure first aid and what needs to be done. So. If you're in a in a place where not everybody knows what to do when there is a, when there is a seizure or when there is a child who's having a convulsion, I would advise to go ahead and look at that seizure first aid um, on Epilepsy Foundation website. Um, and this is this is this was um, um, now adopted all across Illinois. Teachers and school educators now need to know what to do and how to respond when the child's having a seizure. That's all I have for my talk, and I would welcome any questions and um, any comments from the uh, audience. Thank you, thank you, and thanks for the for the plug. Uh, that pays to be local, right? <laughs> yeah. So, and I realized uh, I didn't introduce myself in the very beginning. So, uh, as your moderator tonight, uh, my name is Aisha Akhtar, and I am the director of education with the Epilepsy Foundation of Greater Chicago. As you know, uh, this entire rare epilepsy conference has been. Um, presented to you by four different Epilepsy Foundation affiliates. And so we are the local Chicago affiliate. So very happy to have um, Dr. Tata Char here tonight. She also serves on our Medical Advisory Council. And yeah, please do send us your questions. And while we kind of wait for some questions to come in, and I know there's definitely a lot of comments. Um, I know you had a slide um, that I thought was very interesting on the half-life of rescue medications. And we talk so much about the half-life of anti-seizure meds, but really not at all about rescue meds. And I really, really liked that. And what was very striking to me is that the half-life is as little as four minutes. I think I caught that number. I think as little as four minutes, as long as maybe 20. Could you maybe expound on that a little bit? Oh, you're on mute. Unit. Sorry. Um, so benzodiazepines are the way they're classified is ultra short acting, short acting, intermediate and long acting. So each of the benzodiazepines in the family, the ones I showed on this are just a few. We have a lot more benzodiazepines in the market. For example, um, for anxiety, people use alprazolam. That's an ultra short acting. It's, it's, it's a very short acting. Um, it's, you know, for panic attacks and things like that. So each of these medications are the ones that we use need to act quick and need to have some sustained effect. So it cannot be super short acting and, and then you know, have the risk of having a recurrence of seizure. So we use medications that have a reasonable duration of action, but they reach the peak and, and a sustained action that stays for at least a couple of hours after um, giving this medication. So di in fact, mid, um, among all of these, I'm trying to see if I can pull up my um, um, my benzodiazepine chart here. Um, the ones that we have that we use very commonly are the midazolam, the lorazepam, and the diazepam. And out of those, midazolam is the, is the uh, one that, come, that acts pretty quickly, and then diazepam followed by that, and then the lorazepam after. Right. Um, so and that's why we use these three medications most commonly, not right. only that they, they, they start acting right away, but they also have a sustained duration of action. Um, and they're not like 
super quickly absorbed or excreted. Right. And one thing uh, that we always stress in our training, so in the Seizure Smart School like, that we wrote, mm -hmm. one thing that I wanted to make sure was mandatory was the seizure action plan because you know, you said it yourself as a provider, how important that inform that document is. And what we were learning when we were working with the Chicago Public Schools is that a lot of school personnel had no idea what was happening. So there was this gigantic disconnect. And so that action plan, we just decided that's going to be mandatory. And so that's extremely important. And so all of that information is listed on there the rescue medication that is taken, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And yes, we do that train. So that is built into the training that we provide. And also what we, what we, what we stress is that because a lot of times schools uh, feel that there's a liability issue mm -hmm. when they're right. handling, especially, you know, like Valium, et cetera, and the diazepam. So we always instruct that 911 needs to be called anytime there's a rescue medication and that covers everyone but one thing that everyone uh should know especially in illinois i'm again speaking on behalf of our mm -hmm. state is that the good samaritan act mm -hmm. covers right. anyone who's trying to administer any rescue medication so anyone who in good faith is is trying to administer any rescue medication whether it's rectal buccal or you know whatever um, they're covered, they're protected. And that's one thing that I think uh, once people understand that there is that protection, it kind of like allows people to kind of like take a deep breath and relax a little bit, but still call 911 because that is right. important. And most of the seizure action plans, you know, it's, it's almost like a contract to be honest, and it has to be revisited with every um, um, visit to the doctor or every hospitalization, and discharge because there's always things <clears throat> that change and you know i think that's something that um i would i would say please don't leave it till end of august yeah um you know you, you to try to be proactive about getting the seizure action plans to make it more accurate for your child right right uh and jenna had a quick question what is buckle so if you want to just repeat that definition Sure, buckle is in, uh, is putting it in the side of the cheek. So the, this is the buckle area. So you would open the mouth and just drop. We use a lot of buckle in, I'm sorry, I'm on I calls. know you're on call sorry. tonight. <laughs> Thank you for me. Um, I'll be fine. Um, so usually in infants where, you know, we mm -hmm. worry about diazepam, um, you know, causing respiratory. And, and that was that was the other thing that I, I have to mention that all of these benzodiazepines have a risk of respiratory depression. Right. And that is the other reason we call EMS to come right. in and make sure that the breathing is okay. Um, so with the diastat or the other medications, we worry if they're younger than a year, um, the risk of respiratory depression. So we had been using something called a diazepam that you can, it's a, it's a very concentrated liquid that we could actually put on the side of the cheek and it gets right. absorbed from the cheek. So that's called a buckle. Right. Um, and, and sublingual. Mm -hmm. Is under the tongue. Right. Um, we have films or we used to have like films that would disintegrate under the tongue, similar to how people use um, Zofran or Ondansetron for emesis. So sure. it's something similar to that that would actually, um, you know, s dissolve under the tongue. And we use something called clonazepam, which is right. a slightly longer acting benzodiazepine that is used not for acute prevention, but is used to prevent clusters or concerns for an increase in the frequency of seizures, say with fever or with an illness. Right. That is something that you could place under the tongue and it dissolves under the tongue. Right. And of course, I know you mentioned this, but it's worth mentioning again that not every person with the diagnosis of epilepsy will have a, di a prescription for a rescue medication. And that's something that we always want to make sure we stress mm -hmm. as well in our classrooms as well. Uh, because I think when people hear about some of the, the mechanisms of rescue medication, they panic, but really not everyone is going to have one. Right, uh, actually there was a study that the, um, you know, they had the survey and in fact, we are in pediatrics, I must say we are pretty good, you know, because it also means in school, they have to have this, this rescue plan. And, but if you look at adults with epilepsy, 
it's it's not very common that they have a seizure rescue medication right. or a seizure action plan. Um, and I think that that needs to change because um, either have a laminated card in your in your wallet or have a medic alert bracelet because, right. you know, um, it's really um, it, it becomes important, especially if you have generalized convulsions as you grow older and you are not able to 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 you know explain what's going on for sure and i think that you know as we're kind of entering this sort of no touch society more and more mm -hmm. it's very very important to have something that's very physically right. visible to, to indicate someone on a train or on a bus and uh, to that end at the epilepsy foundation in greater chicago we do provide uh, free medical id bracelets to our registered right. clients and the kinds that actually have the medical the qr code and so those are really great that anyone can kind of just take a photo and get that information right away. But so, yeah, something is very, very important to just kind of make sure that everyone is on board. And someone asked a question about uh, in the school setting. So that is what that is uh, that is what keeps me employed. <laughs> that is, oops, that's what we are doing uh, full time every day is we are going into schools and we are training administration and you know, getting this law passed was the pinnacle of my career. And I think that was just an amazing accomplishment and just hopefully will help so many kids, like thousands of kids to come um, in the future. But it is something that now uh, all schools are aware of and that they cannot um, decline children based on their diagnosis, you know, of epilepsy or any other diagnosis. But again, the Good Samaritan Act is really like in shining light here because it does protect anyone mm -hmm. uh, when they are administering a rescue medication. Uh, the other, the, uh, another thing I wanted to talk about was um, why can't we use these rescue medications like five times or 10 times, you know? Um, and there is a reason for that. There is a reason that we don't use it more than twice. Um, because as, as you remember, I spoke about the receptors and the, um, you know, the, the neurotransmitters. So one, it, the risk of respiratory depression by using repeated doses closer than um, uh, recommended. And the second thing is that it saturates these receptors. So after you give them two doses, there is no more receptors for this medication to act. So we have to use a second or an alternative um, type of medication to stop the seizures. So we recommend, or if, if you talk to your physician um, about using rescue medications, the advice is you can use one or two doses in a particular period of time, but not more than that when they're having a seizure. If you are giving the second rescue medication already in a day, that's the time that you need to talk to your physician. Um, that's the time you need to talk to the EMT right. or, or, you know, at that make, make arrangements to, to go to the ER. Right. Yeah, that's a very important distinction. I think Dr. French might have mentioned that on Saturday as well, like just kind of knowing like when you've kind of crossed over and something goes from like kind of you being used as like a clutch versus something that you're using on a regular basis. There's definitely a big difference there. Uh, there was a question that came up around basically your your role as an epileptologist. So maybe we have to revisit the definition of an epileptologist because I know a lot of times we meet people who are only being seen by a neurologist. And mm -hmm. me personally, I say, no, 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 you've got to go see an epileptologist. Uh, that's a great question. Um, it's a very small niche field where we have um, pediatric epilepsy and they're usually seen in big centers and, and, and larger cities. Now, we all don't live in Chicago. We all don't live in Detroit, right? So um, everybody who's trained in neurology has some training in epilepsy. We all can treat, all of us with a neurology degree can treat epilepsy. But once the epilepsy starts becoming complex, or once the epilepsy starts becoming, uh, or is identified as, for example, a rare epilepsy or an epilepsy that needs specific um, therapies, at that point, that needs to be referred to an epileptologist. Now, I would say an epileptologist is, is somebody who... Um, that's all they do. They treat epilepsy. Okay. Um, for example, I'm just going to say if you have epilepsy, say you had a febrile convulsion or you had a febrile convulsion, um, you know, that maybe two or three febrile convulsions and you saw a neurologist, 
they could they can treat that if you had a childhood absence epilepsy for example where, where you have staring and that needs that has a specific th uh, therapeutic algorithm that can be treated by a child neurologist or a general neurologist however when you start having focal epilepsies that you've given two medications and or you see a structural lesion in the brain and then you need to refer to an epilepsy surgery then then they would start to move towards a specialized center which has um you know an epilepsy program that has epilepsy 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 neurosurgeon um and you know, it's a little bit more niche. Um, rare epilepsy. So many rare epilepsies need to be seen by uh, people who know how to treat these rare epilepsies. They're not run of the mill. They're, they need specific um, interventions. They probably also need specific genetic interventions as well. So these children or these patients need to be referred to a, mm -hmm. a specialist or with uh, or with epileptologists. Mm -hmm. And they can be locally managed by the neurologist. Um, you know, not you know, you don't have to come to the city for every visit. They right. you can have a collaboration with your local neurologist and the specialist and and and, and can you know coordinate care. Right. And I I also think you know I feel like in in me kind of working with the the great epileptologists that I have in the past, I don't know, 10 years. What I've come to learn is that the epileptologist, their personal goal is going to be that seizure freedom goal. And the neurologist, like you said, that there is going to be that little limitation. They, they'll be able to manage mm -hmm. the disease. But I think going with that one step further is mm -hmm. just go, is like going the extra mile. And it's right. so well worth it. And the earlier, the better. Right. But they're not in they're not in large supply. So yeah. I think just just having a second opinion with a, uh, um, a an epileptologist and also looping in your local physician is right. is going to be very helpful. Right. And I did put a link in the chat to the NAEC so that uh, someone can you know type in their zip code and find their nearest place for sure. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to ask you, well, I wanted to mention, I know you had talked about the Alprazolam study, mm -hmm. um, Dr. French. So I, I was looking that up while you were speaking. So that's currently in phase three. Yes. So they're still recruiting until the end of next year or until the middle of next year. So hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll have, uh, we'll be in phase four next year. But that will be uh, another game changer, I think, in the field. I agree. Um, the it's lineup, a very yes. uh, unique um mechanism. Now we also have neuromodulators that we have used in patients who have intractable epilepsy. We spoke about VNS as one of them. There are other mm -hmm. neuromodulators like the um, responsive neurostimulation RNA, right? or the RNS, right. um, which is also now um, used to track seizures in an ongoing basis. Right. Um, and it, it, it sort of does it, um, you know, without your knowledge and it does it when it's implanted in the brain right uh, so that's another um, um new uh, modality of treating right. seizures yeah and i also wanted to ask you if you could tell us uh, your favorite tracker you had mentioned you know there's devices and apps and things do you have one that you would recommend to your patients i have a friend <laughs> so, who's uh, her son is about to start college and so she's particularly curious about what how she can send him off to college in a safe manner so that's a great point because I think, um, and I wanted to talk about that a little bit. I use seizure tracker because that's what we've been using. Um, and I think Nile is the new application that's come up now. Um, you know, it's important to integrate these things, um, but we, we are limited by uh, HIPAA and, 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 EP and you know, um, medical systems. But what you bring up is a great point. When children are transitioning to adulthood, um, you know, I'd like to think pediatric epileptologists really coddle their patients. Um, not to say anything about adult epileptologists, that's how pediatricians are. We tend, tend to, to, to be more um, you know, involved with our patients. And then there is this, this independence that the child now has. And I don't, um, uh, you know, adulting is hard. So um, what we, we tend to see is when they're transitioning into college, there's also the added um, influence of college life. Um, there is the added influence of late nights and stress and alcohol and all of that and, and, and 
non-compliance of medication and the feeling that they're different from the other kids and they, they can't do party. So all of these things come to fore. So I think we need to develop a, a safe system for transition. And um, what I tell my patients is that they can have uh, a local um, physician. They need to know their local pharmacy. They need to have their emergency medication on person and they need to have um, uh, something in their wallet or on their phone that will have the contact information, that will have their medications, and that will have their allergies. And um, the other thing I say is when they're using the dorm rooms to have the lower bunk in the, in the dorm and have a soft um, a carpet a padding underneath um, in case they do fall out of bed, uh, to have a roommate that is knowledgeable and who knows um, about the medical condition uh, of that child, as well as connect with the um, um, you know youth groups of Epilepsy Foundation to see how other kids have navigated um, uh, college because it's a very stressful um, time. So I think that's a great point. Um, and then you know transition is always hard because now yeah. they have to know their medical history and they probably don't know all of that. Um, but yeah. the good thing about it is that kids are very tech savvy. Yeah. And so using that to our advantage has its benefits. For sure, for sure. Well, we are, we've hit the six o'clock mark and I know you are on call tonight, so I don't <laughs> want to keep you, you've been paged already so many times. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for giving us your time tonight. I know I personally, I mean, I've got a bunch of notes. I always learn something from you. So thank you so much for your time you. and your expertise. And I, I know there's a lot of really positive comments and feedback for you in the chat. So. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for being here. We put the links to the survey for today. So let us know uh, how you like the session. And um, Dr. Tathachar, thank you so much and have Thanks. a great night, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Uh, so with that, as you can see on the screen here, we are going to be talking with uh, the Danny Did Foundation. We have Tom Stanton with us today. He is the president um, of Danny Did Foundation. And for those um, who are maybe not familiar with Danny Did, um, it's a Chicago-based advocacy organization focused on awareness of epilepsy. Um, DDF works to improve education and disclosure around the risk of SUDEP and tracks the pipeline of, um, sorry, of technology in the epilepsy space. Um, and DDF has interacted with thousands of families who seek guidance and support um, as part of their search for a monitoring device. And I know personally here in Wisconsin, and I'm sure the other affiliates that are part of this conference, you know, we get a lot of questions um, on this topic. So really excited to have you, Tom. I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, thank you for being here today. Great. Thanks, Alicia. And, uh, and thanks to the conference organizers for, for having, a, having us a part of, of the event. Um, it's great to have the opportunity to talk about our work at Danny did and, and also my nephew, Danny, who I'll introduce you to shortly. Um, but we, we really want to um, interact with all the EF affiliates um, because we, we see ourselves as a complement to other advocates in the epilepsy community. So we're, we're grateful to be a part of this conference. Um, so as Alicia said, I'm Tom Stanton. I'm based in Chicago um, with the Danny did foundation. Um, and I came into this community um, after my uh, nephew Danny was diagnosed with epilepsy when he was two years old. And um, he was um, pretty well controlled by medication. Uh, he had five seizures that his parents witnessed over the course of about two years. Um, you can see Danny here on, on the red, uh, in the red shirt on the left, and then with his three siblings in the group picture. Um, he was the, the third of four kids, uh, my brother Mike and his wife Marianne. And um, Danny only had seizures during sleep. And so like a lot of families, um, there was, there was co-sleeping, there were bed checks, uh, a lot of anxiety around nighttime uh, for fear of missing a seizure. Um, so fast forward to uh, uh, December of 2009, uh, he was just a few months short of his fifth birthday. Um, Danny went to a routine checkup with his neurologist and was told they were on a good path and 
this medication was slightly modified just because of uh, some weight gain, but they left there feeling really optimistic that, you know, he was hopefully going to grow out of his seizure disorder. Um, and then four days later on, on the following Saturday morning, um, his mom came in to check on him in the, in the morning and found him unresponsive. Um, and just a mad scramble ensued trying to revive him and um, just, just the chaos that you could imagine when, uh, when your four-year-old is, is not responsive. So um, unfortunately, Danny passed away from something called sudden unexpected death and epilepsy or SUDEP is the acronym. Some of you may have heard of that. Some of you may have not. Um, Danny, Danny's parents were never uh, aware of, of the term SUDEP before he passed away. Um, now this is in 2009, um, but they were never counseled about that risk from his neurologist. And looking back, you know, that's, that's a, a common thread that we've heard from other families who have lost a loved one is that they have not heard the term SUDEP um, before, before, uh, before losing their loved one. So that's something that we try to focus on with Danny did. And when my brother Mike started the foundation, he really viewed it as, as Danny's new place in the world. Um, obviously not what we wanted in terms of having him here with us and growing up, but um, this is kind of his representation of, of, uh, of his place in the world. And the, the mission or the goal for, for his parents was to help other families to avoid the tragedy that they experienced. And so we kind of have uh, two, two areas of focus. Um, we're pretty specific on, on, on what we advocate around. And so one side of it is just the general awareness of the risks that come with epilepsy, um, including SUDEP. Um, just the idea that parents and caregivers, adult patients all deserve to be informed about all the possible outcomes so that they can make the best possible treatment plan in avoiding some of those risks. The other side of what we focus on um, is, is what I'm going to talk about today, and that's technology in the epilepsy space um, with the idea that um, you know, early intervention or some kind of notification when a seizure takes place is going to lead to some better outcome. And we never proclaim that Danny would be alive today if he was using a device, but we do know that uh, his parents would have liked to have that chance to intervene and to get to him more quickly. Um, so first, I kind of want to start off by just the baseline of risks that we see for people with epilepsy. And, and again, you know, you're, you're all probably very familiar with this. Um, but everything from accidents and injuries to the issues surrounding water, um, driving, uh, the risk for status epilepticus, uh, SUDEP, um, increased risk for, for suicide, unfortunately. All of these things are realities for families who face epilepsy. And, I, and our, our goal or our, our request, I, I guess I would say, is that SUDEP is not left out of that discussion. So, you know, we encourage providers to have this conversation around safety, around risk, and to couch SUDEP within that conversation. Um, and if they, if the family caregiver wants to have a more dedicated conversation about it, at least they're aware enough to, to know what SUDEP is and to ask questions. So um, when you think about intervention, um, you know, you gotta think about what is it that can alert a caregiver or a spouse or a roommate, friend, that a seizure is actually ha happening. And these are some of the indicators that a device could potentially look for in order to give an alert. Um, this isn't to say that there are devices that alert to all of these indicators now, but in just thinking about what could possibly uh, trigger some kind of notification, um, these, are, these are the indications that that exist. So this slide just talks through what we see as, as the benefits to parents, uh, adult patients, caregivers, when it comes to monitoring uh, devices. Um, 
the, the first one I think is really important to acknowledge, and that is that parents are using devices currently. Um, and so if they're being used, uh, we want to advocate for the best possible uh, products being available, um, having a, a dialogue with, with doctors to, to help ensure that there's utility for both the parents, the patient, and the, and the providers. Um, but one thing that comes to mind is just seizure tracking. You know, as, as I'm sure you know, that can be difficult for both the patient and the caregiver for a variety of reasons. So having some kind of device in place can help improve seizure tracking. Um, supervision during, uh, during sleep is really important. And, you know, we've learned over time, there's not a lot of witness cases of SUDEP. And so the idea that if there's somebody present, that would likely reduce the risk of SUDEP uh, occurring. That's not to say that cases of SUDEP haven't happened in the presence of others or even in epilepsy monitoring units, but uh, it appears that having some, somebody present, some kind of supervision is a benefit. Um, and then, you know, this one just speaks to any parent's instincts. You wanna be there to help when your child um, has a seizure. Uh, you don't want them to experience that alone. So being there to reposition them, to check, to make sure they're responsive, to stimulate them in, in some fashion is beneficial. And then there's the ability to administer emergency medications if you're present. And then these last two are, are kind of the, um, the, the, the common talking points that we have with caregivers is that, you know, the child wants some independence, you know, maybe, maybe a device can get them back into their own bedroom. The caregiver is desperate for some peace of mind. The, the thought that if they, they do go to sleep, that they'll have the ability to be notified and that reduces some anxiety and, and lets them get some rest. This next slide, we think it's also important to talk about, you know, how can these systems be beneficial to doctors and nurses and our healthcare providers? Um, because we think in order for these systems to be really optimized and successful, there should be engagement from, from the doctor side as well. And so the first bullet, again, really important, the idea of empowering the patient, empowering the caregivers. Um, these devices do that. They, um, they you know, engage the parents into their own care. And then you know, the idea that someone will be present during a seizure should be just as attractive to the, to the doctor as it is to the caregiver, you know, the idea that someone can intervene on site. Um, and then the seizure tracking component is, is really important. Um, you know, maybe there are fewer seizures happening than, than was thought, and that could maybe um, affect the medication treatment. If there are more seizures or different types of seizures than were known, maybe that leads to more effective uh, medication or, or treatment. So um, just the goal to kind of optimize whatever treatment it is by gathering data, additional data that can be um, provided by a, a device. So we also want to be very upfront that, you know, this, this space of, of devices and epilepsy is still in its early stage. And, and these are not perfect systems. They all have their pros and cons. Um, but we do, we do, um, we do, we do want to acknowledge that. So just having standards about, you know, how do we measure these devices? Um, how often do they give out false alarms? How usable are they? You know, are they, are they easy to use? Are they, um, harder to use for people who aren't, um, as comfortable with technology? And then, you know, if it's a wearable, is the person gonna be self-conscious about wearing it? You know, how does it appear visually? And then the final bullet, you know, super important is how accessible is it? You know, is there um, uh, high per, is there, you know, is there a high purchase price? Are there monthly subscriptions required? Uh, unfortunately, insurance coverage is not super common with these products. So these are all limitations that exist currently. Um, So when thinking about 
you know, we, the most common question we get from, from caregivers is what device should we use? And our position at Danny did is not to be um, endorsing one product over another or, or making the selection for a caregiver, but really just walking them through some common sense uh, questions to ask that hopefully will lead to the best selection for their circumstances. Uh, just given that every circumstance is a little bit different, seizure types, environments at home, age of the user, um, you know, people in the house, all of those things factor in. So these are just five steps that help to think through and talk through uh, the selection of a potential device. And so I, I guess I'll just call out with, with number two, you know, as an example, is seizure tracking the number one goal for your device or is being alerted a top priority for your device and just making sure that the system has the features that match your goals. Um, number three, you know, uh, I'll give the example of wearing a watch. You know, some, some kids may be too young to wear a watch um, as a seizure detection device, or they have skin irritability that's not gonna make that practical. Um, if you're thinking about a pulse, pulse oximeter in the home, you know, will the child keep that on his toe or finger? Um, so just thinking through um, some of the, um, just the comfort issues and, and the tolerability issues for the product. Um, and then number four is, four is, is, is really important, um, just having a comfort level to use the device. Obviously, if it's not used correctly, if it's not used consistently, then you can't um, necessarily expect the optimal uh, protections that come from it. Um, and then number five, number five, just thinking through, is there one, one, one cost at the outset? Are there monthly subscription costs? Um, and how does, that, how does that jive with the ability of the family to, uh, to meet the cost? So now I'm just gonna talk through a few examples of um, systems that are currently in the marketplace. This is not an exhaustive list. Um, these are just some of the more commonly requested systems. Um, and we list these on our website, which is dannydid.org. Um, so this MFIT monitor is, um, is made by um, a company that is based in Finland and they have a US presence in Texas. As you can see, it's a, it's a really kind of thin um, device that goes between the box spring and the mattress. And it is looking for movement um, that can be detected at the surface of the mattress. And it is designed to filter out um, movements that we all have naturally during sleep, rolling over, uh, moving around, et cetera. So it's looking for movement that, that mimics seizure activity. Uh, and it sounds an alert that is emitted from the room where the user is sleeping. So just noting that you would need to be close enough to the bedroom to hear that alarm go off. Um, the Inspire app um, by a company called Smartwatch. Um, it is obviously a, a wristwatch worn device that uh, requires um, the user to have a compatible smartphone and that smartphone would send an alert either through a text message or a phone call to a pre-programmed phone number um, where someone could be notified. So this is a, a popular choice in the instance where the user is off at school or outside the home um, and you can still notify someone who's not with them. Whereas the MFIT obviously is designed for nocturnal use where the caregiver and the user are in the same uh, house. Um, the next product um, is probably the most well-known among uh, seizure detection devices, the Embrace 2 watch. Um, similarly uh, to the Inspire, uh, it's, it's worn on the wrist and the notable about this system is that it is FDA approved to uh, for movement. So it's one of the few devices that has FDA approval. And as a result, 
It's more commonly discussed between doctors and caregivers or doctors and, and adult patients. Um, so that is, um, that is notable for this, this system. This next one is designed to detect uh, movement that occurs during sleep. And the setup for the SAMI is very similar to the setup of a baby monitor where you would have a infrared camera that's mounted on the wall and trained on the area um, that is um, where, where, the, where the person with epilepsy is sleeping. Um, there's a second component, usually an iPod or an iPad that would be in the caregiver's room. And you can get a live look into the space at any point, you know, just like you would with a baby monitor. But if, um, if uh, the movement alarm is triggered, then an audible alert sounds through the uh, iOS device that's in the caregiver's room. So at that point, they'd, they'd have the ability to be notified, get up and go do a well-being check. Um, the other feature that uh, some caregivers appreciate about this system is that um, if the alarm is triggered, it begins to record. So you could review the episode <clears throat> either on your own or share it with your neurologist to kind of provide a firsthand look on how the seizure is presenting. Uh, this, this company is based in Colorado and it was uh, co-founded by two parents who have a son with epilepsy. So the next system is called the Miku monitor and um, another camera based uh, system. Um, it uses uh, radar technology to detect um, around respiration. And the notable about this system is that currently the only alert you will receive is if there's a lack of breathing. So you can get a live visual into the space just like you would with a baby monitor. Um, but the alert is if there's a, a lack of breathing for a specified period of time. Um, and then just kind of a general category um, for people who want to, uh, uh, are interested in like blood oxygen levels. Um, Pulse oximeters are sometimes used for seizure detection. Um, if you're interested in this category, we are, I just wanna make a plug, we're having a, a webinar series that we call Dissecting Devices. And the next one is gonna be featuring a product called the RAD97 from a company called Massimo. Um, it's a pulse oximeter. And um, that, uh, that webinar is, is gonna be on Tuesday, May 18th at 1230 Central. And so if you're interested to register for that, it's free. You can register at dannydid.org. And even if you can't attend for the live session, it will be recorded and we would share the link with anybody who uh, registers after the fact. So I would encourage anybody interested in pulse oximeters to, to uh, tune in for that. So that's kind of a sampling of what's in the marketplace now. But part of what we do at Danny Did is to track what's in the pipeline, what's coming along. Um, and here is kind of just an overview of, of some of the features that we see coming. And you know, one thing that's a, short, a shortcoming right now is typically a device can, can alert to one type of seizure. And what I think a lot of caregivers would appreciate and utilize is a device that can detect more than one type of seizure. So that is, that is hopefully, you know, part of the evolution of this space. Um, and then, you know, devices that can learn over time um, and become more effective as they get to know the user. Um, certainly we hope for more FDA approved devices, although the FDA approval for the Embrace has not yet led to reimbursement. Um, we think that as more devices become approved, as there's more um, you know, evolution between the insurers and the device companies, and certainly us as advocates and caregivers, that there, there should be and there will be um, reimbursement for these systems, hopefully in the near future. Um, and then kind of the holy grail, as we call it, is, is a non-invasive system that predicts seizures 
and then can deliver an intervention to suppress them. So if you think of an invasive or implanted system that, you know, hopes to do that too, you think of something like the, the VNS or the RNS, um, but we hope that one day there will be something that is non-invasive that can do the same thing. And that, that kind of leads to another point, you know, which is I'm kind of running through systems that are um, either wearable or don't require any surgery. Certainly there are other technologies in the epilepsy space um, that, that do, that are more involved, that do inv involve a, a surgical procedure. But I'm, I'm focusing on these non-invasive systems for today. And then something I wanna to pitch or make you aware of as well is that we do have a grant program specifically for access to devices. And so we not only want to counsel families that, A, you know, these systems exist and, and to educate on, on what they do, um, to put people in, in contact with, with the device manufacturer if they have questions that are more involved. But in addition to all that, you know, if, if a family finds something that they think can be useful, we bridge the gap if there's a funding gap um, where there's a, a financial barrier. So. We've, um, we've helped families to date in all 50 states and 14 countries to gain access to devices. Again, you know, our, our role, our desire is not to pick the device for the family, but just to help them think through what's the best fit for them. Um, and then, like I said, if there's a, if there's a funding need, we, we help to bridge that gap. Um, there's an application um, on our website, dannydid.org. If anyone is interested to apply, the, the basic process is to um, fill out the application, um, ask any questions that you may have to the device manufacturer just to make sure it's a good fit. And then we have a phone call with each applicant to, uh, to ensure that you know, the expectations for the caregiver or the adult patient really do align with what the, the device is able to do. So we try to keep it pretty straightforward and um, definitely encourage you to share this program with anybody who you think could be um, benefiting from it. Um, so with that, I, I just wanna thank, thank you again for, for being a part of this, for listening in. Um, happy to answer any questions that, that might come up. And I guess one caveat would be, you know, I'm, I'm not able to speak to really nuanced specific scenarios um, for, for your loved one, but I will kind of help kind of broader questions about um, the device space. Great, thank you so much, Tom. That was wonderful. Um, a lot of information and yeah, I think Alex plugged uh, the Danny Did website um, in the chat for everybody. So definitely check that out. There is a bunch of information on there. Um, you know, all about the devices and everything that Tom went through today, um, the grant program. And it's just a really, it's a really great resource to keep in mind. Um, so yeah, we will go ahead and do questions um, now. So feel free if you guys have any questions for Tom, um, please do put them in the Q&A section. And I think we did have some come up here, Tom. So let's see. Um, uh, okay, so why do you think uh, many physicians do not inform their patients or caregivers about SUDEP? And, um, you know, this is something that we have definitely heard before. Um, so if you have any, you know, input on that, we'd be happy to hear. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. It's certainly in our scenario, it, it was really hard to digest um, the idea that, you know, my brother and his wife really felt blindsided in that they weren't educated about this risk. And I will tell you that just adds another layer of grief and regret, which we can't control necessarily right now. Um, there's, no, there's no surefire prevention for SUDEP, medication, device, or, or other treatment, but we can control the communication. And I think if we inform and empower uh, caregivers um, to, to know about this, you know, we're parents, we hear difficult information all the time and we digest it and that's part of our role. Um, certainly it's not a desirable prospect to think about, but I think most of us would wanna know, 
hey, this is possible. Let's talk about how we can minimize the risk. So I think one reason it hasn't been dis discussed <clears throat> historically is just the idea that um, doctors sometimes struggle <clears throat> with um, action steps to provide once they do share the risk, you know, what, what can we do to minimize it? And so that's where we think, you know, just talking about devices can be one action step, you know, these aren't <clears throat> perfect for everybody or for every scenario, but to look into the space in general or to talk to Danny did um, is, is something that they can say as an action step to help minimize the risk. The other thing is to help empower parents to become advocates for, for more research into what causes SUDEP. Um, right now, there are hypotheses, um, there's more research, but um, I think if we all become champions for you know, what's behind this, I think it will definitely expedite um, finding, finding out what it is and who's at high, highest risk. So um, I could go into kind of more reasons why it's, it's not common, they're not commonly discussed. I think another one is, you know, the lack of FDA approval for a lot of these systems is a standard that the doctors want or need to, to recommend them. And, and so that's why we encourage doctors, you know, if, if, if the discussion about devices come up, feel, feel, feel free to refer people to Danny did and, and we will kind of talk through um, the different uh, options out there and the considerations for them. If the doctor is hesitant to, to have this discussion on their side. Um, so, but I, you know, I, I can't say that the ratio of communication or disclosure has improved as much as we would like it to. I think a lot of parents find out from other parents or from mm -hmm. advocates, um, and that's better than nothing. But we, we've always said that it would be best case scenario if you hear about a risk like SUDEP from your provider. I just think it, it leads to more trust, more open dialogue, and, and better communication. Right. Yeah, I think that is all wonderful and that parents or caregivers, um, you know, if that does come up in a conversation and it's not something you're familiar with, um, you know, we always tell people here in, in, at EF Wisconsin, you know, write down any questions that you have. That's your time with your provider. So be sure to ask those questions. And yeah, it is a hard conversation, but it's it's OK to want to know more about it and to want to be informed. So I think that's yeah, really, really important. Um, we do have some other questions here, Tom. Um, somebody asked, is the face of the Inspire large? Like, what is the ratio for that? Um, you know, I think that would probably be a good question for the manufacturer. I'll show the picture again. Sure. If that helps a little bit, um, you can see it here. Um, I... <clears throat> I think maybe a little larger than a, a typical watch, but certainly if anybody wants to be in touch with um, the company, they're very accessible. And I'd be, uh, we do link to their website from dannydid.org. Great, thank you so much. Um, another question here, um, is there any, de any devices that can detect absence seizures at this That's time? a great question. So, you know, there are gaps right now that exist, and that is one of them. Um, there's a company called Eyes, E-Y-Z-S, um, that is developing um, a product that uh, essentially tracks eye movement as a means to um, detect and alert to ops on seizures. So it's in development. Uh, it's not available yet, but um, that's definitely an area of need, and um, there are there are not great options for those types of seizures right now. That's wonderful, though. I know you talked about you know new new devices coming out all the time, so that's really great to know. Um, and with that, Tom, so for example, for that device, um, and then anything else coming down the pipeline, um, you know. Where can people go to find that information? Would you, um, is dannydid.org the, the place where, you know, they could go to find new devices um, or any other locations? Yeah, so I would say typically on our website, we limit to what is available now. Um, it, like if you went to our website and saw something listed there, it is, it is accessible. That's kind of our standard that you could get it. 
Um, but if, if families hear about a product um, that they're interested in, um, we encourage you to reach out and we'll tell you what we know about it. Oftentimes these startup companies do reach out to us and they wanna hear about patient preferences um, just get the perspective of the patient, get the perspective of the, the caregiver. What are some of the features that they're looking for? Um, the Epilepsy Foundation has a, um, a conference every year that that's, they call the Pipeline Conference. Um, so there is some information on epilepsy.com about that event, which is uh, June 5th and 6th. And within that event, there's something called the Shark Tank competition. And Similar to the TV show, the concept is that, you know, you have five or six startup companies that have um, novel ideas on how to improve um, treatment for epilepsy, care for epilepsy. And many of them, I'd say the majority of them are, are devices. So I would say to, to keep, uh, keep an eye out for information about the Shark Tank co uh, competition, EF certainly promotes the winners every year. And, um, does newsletters and social media around those companies. Wonderful. Thanks, Tom. Um, we did have another question. I see. Um, can the use of an oximeter each night help stop, help slash stop detect um, the beginnings of SUDEP? And I know that you brought up um, the pulse oximeter device. I think that was a few slides back. Um, that is coming out. So maybe. Yeah, I, I don't know that I want to make a definitive claim that, you know, using a, a pulse ox will help prevent SUDEP. Certainly that's the hope with all of these systems is that the intervention um, helps prevent sudden death. Um, but there's certainly, you know, no uh, published literature or um, research where we can definitively say, say that. Um, I guess I would say the pulse ox is able to um, track and alert to different kind of um, different seizure indications than just movement. And that's where families um, can find some value in, in that kind of system is if they're looking to be alerted to something other than movement. Okay, and I know you, I know you said um, there was a webinar coming up um, and Alex plugged in the website in the chat. Um, can you just remind us that was Tuesday, May 18th, I believe, and what time? Exactly. Yep. Tuesday, May 18th at, at uh, 1230 Central. Um, we keep our webinars to about 45 minutes. Um, it's a presentation from the, the manufacturer directly to, to explain, you know, how does their system work? What does it cost? You know, what are the, uh, with, with the, with the RAD8, um, they're, they're hopefully for many people will be some in, insurance coverage, um, but all those types of questions can be posed to them directly. And like I said, if you register but can't attend live, you would still get a link to the recording. Okay, that sounds great. Um, another question here, are there any studies for new devices um, that uh, people can participate? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I would say from time to time there are. We, we, um, we do hear from companies that are if not a, a, an outright study, certainly like surveys where they're looking for patient preferences. Um, but from time to time, there are studies and I would say kind of watch our social media um, and website for any opportunities like that. Great. Um, so yeah, if anybody has any other questions, feel free to go ahead and put them in the Q&A now. Um, Tom, I just wrote a couple things down myself. Um, so I know you mentioned insurance and there's limitations um, and you talked about the grant program, which is wonderful. Um, I just wonder, is there any trial period for devices that you know of where, where people can try it out or have like a dummy device maybe even? Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah that's a good question. Um, it depends on the manufacturer. Some of them do have pretty generous uh, return policies. So the idea that you could, you know, potentially get a device for a few months and use it, set it up, see how effective it is, um, is possible with some of these companies. Um, in general, when we fund a device for our family, we encourage them to use it for at least a year. Mm -hmm. um, the reason being, 
um, best case scenario, it's not detecting to anything. And you, and you have, you know, this added peace of mind that you're not missing seizures, but we'd hate for somebody to think prematurely that, you know, they don't need a device. And then, you know, there's a, a breakthrough scenario or something like that. So we definitely encourage families, unless there's a, you know, a, a technical issue or, um, <laughs> you know, issues with the product in terms of usability. Once you do get a device, we encourage families to use it for at least a year. Okay. But um, there are companies that will give these shorter horizons to try, to try it out. Nice, that's great. And if there are any complications with any of the devices, um, I assume they would, the family would go through the manufacturer, not Danny did, correct? Exactly, yeah. So that's an important port, point kind of for our process. Um, we fund the family directly, and then the family places the order. And the primary reason for that is we want the relationship and the communication to be between the device manufacturer and the, and the caregiver or the adult patient so that they're getting the most accurate, you know, most recent um, information, and that Danny did is kind of the funding bridge. We're always happy to help facilitate communication um, where it's necessary, but it's, it's mostly routed directly to the company. Great, thank you for that. Um, just a couple more here. Um, is, there a is there a device called Seize Alarm? Yeah, Seize Alarm is an app um, that is used in companion with a Apple Watch. And um, there is a link to it on our website. If you wanna go to dannydid.org and click on the devices button, you can read more about the C's alarm. Wonderful. Um, and then Tom, I don't know if you can necessarily speak on cost. Um, somebody was asking, you know, roughly, well, is it, are they hundreds of dollars, thousands? I'm sure they vary depending on the device. Yep. But if you can speak on that. Sure. Um, I guess if I'll, I'll give a quick rundown from what we talked about today. So the, the MFIT is a one-time cost. Um, ballpark, you know, please check the website for the latest, but about $600, um, one-time cost, no monthly subscription. Um, the smartwatch, there's a cost for the, um, for the watch itself, the hardware, and then the monthly subscription. Um, the watch I believe is a couple hundred dollars. And then the monthly subscription is, is, uh, I think there's three options, you know, 9.99, 19.99, I believe 29.99. You know, slightly different features with each. So that's subscription based. Same with the Embrace. There's a one-time cost around 250, and then some monthly subscription costs. The Sammy, it's sold in a few different product uh, options, but ballpark um, for what they call the standard three kit, it's about. $900 um, one-time cost. Uh, the MeQ, I believe is a one-time cost in the range of $350. Um, and then the pulse oximeter, I wouldn't even quote, it's really gonna depend on uh, insurance plans. So those are ballpark um, numbers. And again, you know, definitely check um, the product websites for the for the specific details. Great, thank you, Tom. And one other point on that, Alicia, that I'll mention: when we fund a grant, if there is a subscription aspect, a monthly mm -hmm. subscription, um, just so everyone knows, we fund, we we cover the cost of the hardware, and then we cover the cost of one year of subscription costs. So. Uh, we want to make sure, you know, obviously if you can't pay the monthly, it's not going to do you any good. So we, we, we bundle those together, pay for the hardware and one year of subscription costs, and then we can kind of reevaluate how it's working after a year. That's wonderful. Yeah, that was actually my next question. I was going to ask about the monthly subscriptions. That's great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, let's see here. So any other questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, someone just said that's wonderful about the subscription costs. Yes. I'm just looking through to see if I missed anything. 
I don't see anything, Tom. Um, and I, I've been writing down a bunch of notes myself. Um, you know, like I said, we get questions here at EF Wisconsin, and I'm sure the other affiliates as well, all the time on devices. So, um, you know, this has been very, very helpful. Um, I, we appreciate your time, um, but if anybody has any other questions, you know, we can go ahead and take those now. Otherwise, I do not see anything else at this time. Yeah, feel free to, if questions come up, um, people can contact us through our website. Yeah. And we're always happy to, to interact. And um, again, just appreciate the chance to, to be a part of this and to partner with Epilepsy uh, Foundation in all its chapters. Yes, great. Thank you, Tom, so much for your time. We greatly appreciate you being here um, and taking time and educating us. Um, and like he said, if there's any other questions, you can go um, to dannydid.org and um, ask questions through that and check out all the devices. And um, there's a lot more information on there as well. Well, welcome to those who have joined us. We're just gonna wait a couple minutes um, for others to join. See, we have the attendee list uh, increasing here. So again, we'll just give it a couple more minutes before we officially get started. Welcome to everyone joining. I think we'll give it another minute or two because I see that we are still having people come in and then we will get started officially. All right, I think I will just officially kick us off here. Uh, good evening or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our last breakout session of the second annual Upper Midwest Rare Epilepsies Conference. Uh, we will be discussing genetics in rare epilepsies here today. And so um, before I turn it over to our guest speaker, I'll just quickly introduce myself and run through a couple of housekeeping things. So I am Jenna Carter. I am the Associate Exec Executive Director of the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota, where I lead our mission and strategy work. And I am very happy to be here today moderating this session. And so um, I just wanna bring, I, I wanna call to attention to everybody that this is a webinar format for Zoom. And so uh, you do not have video um, on and you will not be able to unmute yourself, but we do have the Q&A function set up. So please feel free to use that whenever you have a question. And as Dr. Smith is doing his presentation, I'm sure he'll, he'll answer some of those questions, but we also will have time at the end to, to answer those and to ask him any additional questions that we might have. And so I also want to thank Alex, who is from the Greater Chicago Epilepsy Foundation, and Alicia, who is joining us from the Wisconsin Epilepsy Foundation. 
they're going to be helping just make sure everything runs smoothly. They'll be monitoring the chat. And so uh, thank you to the both of you for your, your willingness to help us out here tonight. Uh, so today I am very, very happy to welcome our guest, Dr. Doug Smith, who is a practicing pediatric epileptologist with the Minnesota Epilepsy Group. Dr. Smith graduated from the College of New Jersey before attending New Jersey Medical School. He completed his pediatrics residency at Our Lady of the Lake Regional Medical Center and his child neurology residency at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, where he also completed his fellowship. His areas of expertise and interest include genetic epilepsy, neonatal epilepsy, metabolic and mitochondrial epilepsy, tuberous sclerosis, and gene therapy. Dr. Smith has been published in many leading journals and frequently lectures and presents um, at a variety of organizations, including uh, the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota. So thank you so much, Dr. Smith. And outside of medicine, uh, Dr. Smith enjoys exploring state parks with his daughter, uh, where they both like to discover all the birds and insects and flora that Minnesota has to offer us. So welcome, Dr. Smith, and I will turn it over to you. All right. Uh, hopefully you guys are saving the best for last here. Uh, it's always, uh, I never know whether this is the best talk to go first or to go last, certainly not before Dr. French. I, she is such a wonderful speaker. Um, and uh, I'm charged with a very, very tall order kind of wrapping up uh, the story of genetics in, in a quick one hour uh, uh, conversation in a way that is useful to all the different people who wind up attending these, this, this uh, kind of lecture, which the, the short version for genetics is that it's very com it's complicated and more complicated than you think. And it's all always seems to be it's getting more and more individualized. And so it doesn't really lend itself very well to a one hour conversation. So I'm going to try to break it down into shorter, more answerable questions um, that we can that hopefully will be applicable to the majority of people who are attending today. So we start by asking uh, the, the very what what seems like a very simple question, well, what is genetic testing? What kinds of genetic testing is there? Since what's one of the first things, whenever I ask patients, oh, have you been genetically tested? Oh yeah, we did testing a while ago. And when I follow up with this one, I often get kind of the, the, the blank look of, wait, there's more than one type of test. And I'll walk you through a basics of genetics and not just enough to understand what the different types of testing there is. Oh man, I think I actually, I changed the order on this just a little bit. Um, I, I, I do this primarily because I think the, the, the majority of people uh, come to this kind of conversation with the question of, is this something for me? Is this something that I actually need to get done for either me or for my loved one? And, uh, and then after that, we'll kind of use that to say, well, what is it actually, what do we do with that information? Um, I have to address this just because it's probably, if you have gotten genetic testing, you've probably gotten this very confusing answer of, oh, we, we think we have something, we're not totally sure. It's so common that it's worth talking about because it ties in very uh, meaningfully with the initial conversation of what kinds of genetic testing there is. Um, and, and that's also going to help inform that, wait a second, we actually don't know everything about this. And so I'm going to use that as, as kind of a, a zooming out opportunity to talk about well, what's the state of our understanding of genetics. And I'll help you understand why this is a little bit of the Wild West and why doctors are continuously changing our interpretations on what we're actually seeing with, with the genetics piece. And then we'll get to the, the practical of, okay, we've done the testing, we've got an answer. What can we do with this information? And then more interestingly, what can we do about this in the future? And so I'm going to kind of quickly talk about, well, when I get an answer for patients, what does it actually change for their day to day? And then what do I think is going to wind up happening both with genetic testing, but what do we do with this information in the future? As always, whenever you're hearing any of these conversations, it's really important to have a, a frank conversation about any kind of financial disclosures. Uh, I have no uh, disclosures that are relevant to this conversation, most importantly, because I'm talking about genetic testing. While I do all these genetic tests, I don't have stock in any of them. I have no interest in any of these companies. I make no money regardless of what you choose to do with your genetic testing. And so let's start off that conversation with, okay, what kind of genetic testing and uh, the, the genetics 101 piece before we get to, to that. So the basics of genetics is that you have 46 chromosomes. And this is what those 46 chromosomes look like on, on a karyotype. 
Now, there's a ton of information on all of these chromosomes, and you've probably kind of seen a lot of this before, and then the, they have the 22 pairs of autosomal chromosomes, and then two, uh, one pair of sex chromosomes, as in those are the ones that determine whether, you're, whether someone is male or female. Um, and the metaphor I like to use for this is that these are like 46 books, okay? And so there's a ton of information, a ton of individual letters in these books, which are made up of the genetic code A, C, T, and G. And some of these books are bigger than others. Uh, some of them are quite frankly gigantic because if you stacked all these 46 books on top of each other, they'd be about 300 feet tall. Um, but that's kind of fundamentally what they actually contain. The majority, 99% of those books are parts of the story that never get read. So I think of it as like the table of contents, footnotes, references, the index, all the parts, again, that, that they're there, they're useful, but you don't actually read them. Now, yeah, there's, there's my book metaphor. So again, 300 feet tall. So that's essentially the gigantic pair, uh, all this amount of information that's encoded in every single cell in your body. So we're gonna be using this metaphor a lot, so it's gonna be worth repeating, that the chromosome is one book, you have 46 books, but are really 23 pairs of books. The genes are the parts of the story that actually get read, that actually tell the story. And there are about 20,000 of these genes uh, in your DNA. And you have two copies of every single one of these genes. So about 40,000 sentences that are spelled out in A's, C's, T's, and G's. Now, what we've gotten good at are kind of the basic pieces of this, just the actual putting, taking our cells, taking our information, and writing out these books. And so that's going to look in a couple of different ways. The testing where we actually just count the books is the most basic type of genetic testing that there is. And it's, it used to be the only thing we could do, and it's called the karyotype. Karyotype is exactly what you see in front of you. So what you wind up doing this testing and they've taken under the microphone, the uh, microphone, <laughs> take, take a look at it under the microscope. They dye it in a certain way, which gives it these telltale bands, so the alternating dark and light. And then they just look at it and take a picture. And then they see are all the bands that we would expect to be there present and are there in the right place. This is what a normal karyotype would look like. And they want to comparing each one of these against a reference to make sure that all those stripes are completely normal. We don't really do this testing anymore for, for many, many reasons. Um, and firstly, is because most of the time that we're can diagnosing these conditions, we can tell even before we do the karyotype. So by far the most common one that we wind up doing this for is trisomy 21, better known as Down syndrome. Um, there are other rarer ones like Edwards syndrome, uh, trisomy 18, and ring, ring 20, which was a, a, a hot topic back when I was in training. And I, I, the only reason I order karyotypes anymore is with um, it's looking for ring 20. Even this, though, we can capture with our newer technology. Other examples of what an abnormal karyotype would look like uh, would be this one. This is trisomy 21. Again, they have three copies of this uh, uh, chromosome number 21. And this is an example of ring 20. I can tell you having uh, spent time with the people in the lab that do this, even these, it's, it's so hard to tell. If you're actually like literally taking pictures and cutting them out and then like comparing them to other ones. It's a very um, almost artistic process, to, at, least, at least to me as someone who only did it, you know, a couple of times to learn what, it, what it's like. The next level up is what we would call a chromosomal microarray. And so if a chromosomal microarray, we're really fundamentally just asking how much information is here. And so what they would do is they would look at the, the, uh, each one of those chromosomes and they would ask how many pages are in this book. And we know how many pages are in a typical chromosome one, for example. Um, it turns out, believe it or not, that it's really common to have an extra page or two or to be missing a page or two in your book and for it to make not actually any difference whatsoever in the long-term outcome. I still remember the first time when they were like, hey, this, this book is missing like 15 pages. It's like you skipped a whole chapter basically and it's in a normal person. And it, it still blows my mind to think that, you know, we're all thinking that uh, for, for so many of the patients I see, it's literally one letter that's off. We can have 15 pages and it means absolutely nothing in terms of causing a problem. Um, it doesn't say anything about the content of the letters in those books because it's not actually reading them. 
It's just seeing whether or not all of them are actually there. Um, so again, this is called a chromosomal microarray, better known, uh, also commonly called a SNP array. SNP is single nucleotide polymorphism. Um, this is, is used to be a very popular test because it was cheap and it was easy for us to get done. And insurances used to force us to do this test first before doing what we actually know is the more useful test. And there are certain situations where I do order a chromosomal microarray, but for the most part, this is not the useful type of test that we, that we see in epilepsy. Uh, this is just kind of an example of what it looks like. We know uh, this, this is what a patient sample would look like in terms of their uh, DNA content. Uh, and this is what a normal control looks like. And then they compare the two to see whether or not there's more or less of that, uh, that particular type of DNA. Now I'm gonna do the actually a whole nother level which fits my metaphor very well, but isn't as commonly used. Um, that's whole exome or whole genome testing. So again, zooming out for just a second, that karyotype is counting all the books, but not looking at any of the letters or how big those books are. The second one is going to be counting all the pages, but again, not looking at the letters at all. Whole exome and whole genome is where we're actually now looking at all those letters. Whole genome is spelling out, for the most part, every single letter in every single book. Now, this is still an oversimplification because you might, if you're paying attention to the news, you would see that we have only now, like in the last couple of months, done for the first time, sequenced every single letter of a genome. Because it turns out there are letters actually on the cover and on the back cover of the book that we're not so good at sequencing. So we've only just now gotten to that point where we were able to do the covers of those books. Um, Whole genome sequencing is every single letter, both in the index, table of contents, footnotes, references, everything. Whole exome, on the other hand, is only looking at that 1% of the DNA that tells the story, the genes, those specific sentences, looking at those 20,000 sentences and just spelling them out, A, C, T, G, et cetera. Um, it gets complicated after this point, all right? So, the way that we kind of start thinking about this afterward is that, so the technology has gotten to the point that we're very good at getting those letters, but it's written in a foreign language. It's written in a, in a genetic language that we're still in the process of understanding. And so we're good at doing this now and we're, we're able to do this for relatively cheap, but we're actually struggling at, at getting good, useful information out of it. And so because the interpretation is actually more complicated than scientifically doing this process, we don't tend to order whole exomes or whole genomes that often. Instead, what we wind up doing are gene panels. So gene panels are, we know basically what dysfunction in a certain number of genes looks like. Out of those 20,000, we aren't even close to understanding what the majority of those are doing. And so if we see an abnormality in them, we're just gonna left scratching our heads and saying, I don't know if this actually means a dang thing. So with gene panels, what we're doing is we're focusing on ones that we understand what this disease looks like. And specifically when it comes to epilepsy, we are now doing the panels, we're doing just the genes that we know if there's a problem with this gene, epilepsy can result as part of this problem. Now, when I was in training, this was about 15, 20 genes. Currently the panel is about 300. And so this panel keeps growing every single day. And it's always one of the first questions I have whenever I see a patient who's had a gene panel done is, well, how long ago was it done? Because every year we do this, that number increases in terms of uh, what, what genes are on that panel. It used to be that we'd have to do relatively targeted ones. It used to be the way that, that companies would try to, try to kind of get into that market is that they would kind of offer, okay, this is for if you have an abnormal MRI in epilepsy, if you have a uh, 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 seizures before the age of two, or you have intellectual disability and seizures, you know, these are the panels for you. Um, now they're actually, they're so cheap to do. They're so easy to do that pretty much we can do all 300 of these genes for the same cost to your insurance as it would to be sequencing a single gene. So now we pretty much take the approach of if we're doing genetic testing, we're testing all of them because even if it doesn't, I don't think this applies to you right now, that might change in the future. And at the end of the day, if it costs the same to get the information on 300 genes, it's kind of the same way of saying, if I could get an X-ray of your chest and just look at your chest, um, or I can do the exact same thing, exact same amount of time, but now I have a, 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 a CT scan of your entire body, 
it sometimes makes sense just to do the entire body. X-rays doesn't quite pan out because there's radiation involved. I know it's a, not a great metaphor, but it's essentially the same idea in that it's, it takes the same amount of effort to get all 300 done. Now, when we do this though, we wind up getting some things that aren't entirely, aren't entirely clear. As I had mentioned, you know, we're, we're basically trying to learn hieroglyphics. We're trying to learn another language. And so we wind up with a lot of answers. We're not really sure what they mean. And we call these variants of unknown significance. Now, we physicians love to create all this jargon and make things sound more complicated than they actually are. Variants of unknown significance is our fancy way of shrugging our shoulders and saying we're not entirely sure. So variance means it looks different. Unknown significance means I don't know if this is a problem or not. And so what we're doing when we do our testing is we're writing out all these letters. And what we do is we compare them to normal people. We compare them to the general population. And if the change is present in less than one out of 10,000 people, we are now calling this a variant. This is clearly something different from most people. Now, the problem is I can't tell if this difference is the same as being like, okay, is this the whole reason that someone's eyes are blue as opposed to brown? Now that's a difference, but that's not actually a cause of disease. That's not actually a problem. Um, and obviously all of us have very different DNA. You know, there's a, a very, very, very small fraction of our DNA that differs from person to person. And so what we wind up doing is, again, that's how we kind of establish that initial, it looks different. There are some things that we know cause problems, but there's a whole lot more we're actually not entirely sure. So the easy metaphor there is in the English language, if you replace the letter C with a letter K, 99 times out of 100, that is not going to change the meaning of that sentence. You can read right through it and you understand exactly what the intention was. However, if we have a letter, the word uh, B-A-T and we replace the A with an E, well, now we've changed the meaning from bat to bet. And it really does boil down to the context uh, for all of these things. So as I had mentioned, if it looks different, we can't always tell if it's a problem. And that's where I come in now and trying to figure out, now this is your doctor's job to help figure out, does this actually mean something? And even now, I still can't tell. Um, the easiest way that we do this is we ask, okay, what do other people who have uh, this problem look like? And so the, I'll use the most common example, SCN1A. Uh, we have a pretty dang good understanding at this point of what mutations in SCN1A look like. And if I'm testing a child who looks like these other kids who have SCN1A, coming back with a difference in their SCN1A, well, now putting this together, it sounds like this is very likely going to be that, that mutation is causing this problem. And we also have to look at, do other family members have this? So I didn't talk too much about this, um, but genetic doesn't always mean run in the family. Genetic means it's in your genes. Now, why is that special? Well, it turns out that whenever any one of us gets made, there are about six typos that are made in the span of those 20,000 genes. And this is just kind of how naturally, how, how evolution or how changes wind up happening over time is because this this uh, process of making new humans is imperfect, that we see these little changes. And it would be a heck of a coincidence if, uh, and so, so I should say, um, for most of the time when those changes happen, it winds up just producing something that's a little more idiosyncratic, like a, again, a, a change in height, perhaps, a change in hair color, change in, you know, one of those more basic features, but rarely this does result in a rare epilepsy disorder, you know, or just rare disease in general. And this is one of the more common ways in which rare diseases occur is when a typo happens in one of these genes. And so, so that's what I mean by it might be genetic, sorry, it might be uh, in the family and genetic, or it might be not in the family and genetic because this might have been a typo that happened when that sperm and egg came together. And so it wouldn't be something I'd expect to see in mom and dad. Uh, in fact, most of our epilepsy disorders are going to wind up being inherited in that way, particularly the ones that I see that are very young onset, typically do not actually run in families. When they do run in the family, um, this is something that we can, that actually is very helpful for us. Uh, we will actually, uh, typically we are allowed to test family members for free whenever there is a variant, a variant of unknown significance that we're not sure about. So where does this come in handy? Let's just, again, take that SCN1A example where I have a child who has severe epilepsy and their variant doesn't totally make sense in terms of, uh, we're not sure if this is causing a problem or not. 
mom and dad are completely healthy. No one in the family has epilepsy. Well, half of that, their kids' genes came from mom, half came from dad. If we test mom and dad and one of them has this SCN1A mutation and they don't have epilepsy, well, now I have a data to tell me, okay, perhaps not everyone who has this problem has epilepsy. Um, it depends on the mutation. Uh, for a lot of these, you need two bad copies. Um, and that's kind of one of the more important aspects of it. Does this make sense? Uh, SCN1A, you only need one bad copy, but for a lot of these others, um, if we see a variant in something where we need two bad copies, we're not gonna bother testing anything else. And this actually covers 90% of these variances that we talk, that variants of unknown significance um, that we talk about because the majority of these, it, it doesn't matter if you have one that looks different if the other one of these genes looks completely normal. Again, going back to those 23 pairs of books, two copies of every one of these genes. Then what we wind up doing as part of this, and this actually even happened before all this, I just, I, I talk about it last, I think it makes um, more sense this way. Well, we have Google translates for these. Again, this is a foreign language metaphor and we run the sequence of, of, of letters through uh, the equivalent of our Google translate and we ask them, what do they think? And for the most part, they agree in the interpretation as to whether or not there's going to be a problem. But in order for something to be classified as a variant of unknown significance, there's disagreement amongst the protocol, amongst the uh, computer algorithms that are looking at this. One thinks this is a problem. One thinks this is not a problem. After all this analysis, sometimes we still can't tell. And, we're, and often it just takes time where uh, it, what winds up happening is, okay, let's just say I have one kid who has, an, actually, I might be able to talk about something that happened to me even earlier today, where uh, it came back as we're not sure what this is. And it took years, but they found four others that had mutations in the same gene and they all look really similar. And then they finally concluded years later that, hey, this is the cause, but we took, oh, it needed to have these other kids sequence in order to first figure this out. And so again, I just talked a whole lot about what do we not actually know about. And so I think this is a really helpful time to just stop and just be like, okay, this is a relatively new technology. It's not crypto new, um, but it is certainly new stuff that, that is a continuously evolving, continuously changing landscape where we often have to change our minds and say, wait a second, maybe this isn't what we were thinking. And, and I think that this perspective might, might help us understand why. So uh, many of us might be uh, old enough to remember when the Human Genome Project was completed. Uh, it was announced completed as in 2002. Um, and um, what, what that was is it took 13 years for over 200 different uh, scientists with 20 different labs uh, to sequence the first human genome. And it, took, it cost $3.8 billion, which believe it or not was 20% under budget uh, when this was all completed. And this was considered a landmark occasion in understanding the human genome. And I think this is why so many people think we've got this solved, we understand where this is coming from. So again, three, it took 13 years, $3.8 billion. And now this, this article is from 2019, uh, the country of Iceland had its entire genome sequenced at $600 per person. Um, and so obviously we are talking worlds, orders of magnitude difference in terms of cost. And so when you're talking $3.8 billion per person to get this sequence, you're obviously going to be much more careful about who you're sequencing than when it's $600 per person. I will add one of the reasons this was so cheap, as I had mentioned, it's the interpretation, understanding it that's much more complicated. And so in Iceland, they were not looking to, to be screening for diseases. They were actually trying to figure out because they have a, they're a, uh, um, I have a founder effect. Um, basically, most Icelanders are somewhat related to each other. They were using that information to determine, to avoid uh, significant inbreeding so they could recognize the risks of rare diseases. Now let's fast forward a little bit further to my Facebook feed. I don't know if you guys get this advertisement, but obviously uh, my, my Facebook is listening to me and heard that I talk about uh, genomes a whole lot and said, hey, you're thinking about it. Now it's 300 bucks and we'll do your whole genome too, 30 times. Um, it's effectively like 23 in me that this service particularly uh, particularly is, and um, they wind up selling a lot of that data in the end. Um, but the point is, is that even if they're selling it $300 per person compared to $3.8 billion. So you can easily see that the amount of information that we are getting 
is a it is drinking uh, um, uh, out of a fire hose at this point. That before we were getting this tiny little drips of water that we we're trying to, to to drink off of, and now we have way more information than we know what to do with. And so this goes along with the observation of Moore's law. Now Moore's law is was the uh, famous observation. I want to say it was in the nineteen seventies that um, the number of transistors that you can fit on a microprocessor doubles every two years. And as a result, computing power doubles every two years, and the cost of computing gets cut in half every two years. And so as our computers get better, the, the, uh, these tests get dramatically cheaper. And so following that principle, so this is on a logarithmic scale, each one of these ticks goes up by 10 times, not by you know, going from 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, it's going from 1,000 to 10,000 to 100,000. And again, th even this isn't accurate because that first one was 3.8 billion. It was a, a ton on top of that as well. But that was for one that was started in 1990, of course. So at that time, it was about 100 million and it dropped again to nowadays to around $300. You notice there's this precipitous drop in the middle and that was actually really where the transformative years came from because we got much smarter with our technology doing something called next generation sequencing. Basically this technology where we would wind up just chopping up the DNA and wind up uh, doing it a hundred times and then having a computer rearrange it afterward, which made it so much easier and so much cheaper for us to figure this out. And so as a result of that, our understanding skyrocketed right around that time. So while I was still in training, I still remember actually when I trained with a geneticist in my general pediatrics training, um, and I don't want to think about the years as to when that was. Uh, it's longer ago now than I care to care to. The, I don't have the gray hairs yet, so I, I think I, I look a lot younger than I actually am. But when I was trained, they specifically said there are no epilepsy syndromes, genetic epilepsy disorders that have only epilepsy. And so that was common practice in the early 2000s, um, which even wasn't true then. But when, the, when this technology explosion happened, there were really about 10 or 15 genes that we even knew about. And at that time, you had to test each one of these individually, $500, $600 per gene to test. Now, all of a sudden, we can test much more easily. And so what do we think we start doing? But scientists are testing a whole lot more. And when we start testing a whole lot more, we have, again, this explosion of all these genes that we've discovered. And so here's another about 20 genes that wound up being discovered since 2007. And as I had already mentioned, now this number is up to 300. And you can only imagine where this is going to wind up plateauing where we actually have all of them. I have no idea when we're going to hit that plateau. That's your guess is as good as mine. But the point is, is that for all of these, this, was, this is still very, very new stuff. And for many of the genes that I'm talking about, we've really only discovered in the past three or four years, and we don't understand them all that well. And so I, I like to talk about when I first started my genetic clinic here, that four years ago, it got started, no one was doing it because it was incredibly expensive and difficult to get. Cost between four to $5,000 to get that typical panel of 50 to 60 genes. And insurance typically said no, and that was actually why most people weren't doing it because they didn't, didn't have the energy or time to fight insurances. It would take three months to get it done. You would need to arrange for a blood draw, which if you're working at a hospital, that's easy, but I work at a clinic where I don't have someone who can draw blood right away. So it'd mean a second trip for families, another inconvenience. Um, and again, I'm only getting 50 or 60 genes at the end of the day. I actually even, I got a grant to help lobby uh, insurance companies to improve coverage. And there was this conference where they're gonna teach me how to lobby. And in between from when it got accepted to when I actually went to the conference, a new panel came out that was completely free. And so this wound up solving the problem at the end, uh, one of the few problems in healthcare that got solved uh, that easily. So anyway, there's um, the whole reason you hear a lot of doctors talk about Invite behind the, the uh, or sorry, using Invite these days or why a lot of people are testing is that there's this one company that is now offering it for free up to the age of eight. Now, I, I'm sure there's a lot of skeptics in the audience. I actually am one of those skeptics in general. There's no such thing as a free lunch, right? I just talked about how my genome is only $300. Um, this is free because there are multiple pharmaceutical companies that have treatments specific for very rare disorders. And they, those treatments work only when they're given very, very young. So the faster we discover these individual patients, the better those outcomes are. Now, these pharmaceutical companies are 
Um, they are obviously interested in their drugs succeeding, but the ones that are doing this are actually, from, the, from my experience, they are medications that make a really big difference. And so they are funding the, the, uh, the testing for all these kids just to find these very rare disorders and treat them at a very young age. And I, I, ha I was a skeptic at first because uh, you know things you often think are only as good as what you pay for them, right? So the, the free panel can't be very good. I, I've come around. They're actually, these are excellent panels and this is pretty much the only one that I wound up ordering anymore. So again, free up until the age of eight if you have a diagnosis of epilepsy. Um, don't need blood anymore. It's as simple as either spitting in a tube or doing a cheek swab. Um, if you're busy, uh, we, they will mail you this, the, the kit to your house where you'll swab yourself and mail it right back. Again, over 300 genes as opposed to the 50 that I was paying $5,000 for before. And if it is not covered, uh, if you don't happen to qualify for this free program, uh, typically the out-of-pocket cost is only like $250. And so because of this change, everyone is doing genetic testing now. And, um, and it's, all, it's kind of on, every, on the front of everyone's thoughts because there are some doctors who are very, very comfortable with it, particularly the younger doctors who are more recently trained. Um, but the ones who were trained a while ago, they're still op operating under that old model where they don't do any of this and that all of this is really handled by genetic counselors. And they are coming up to speed very quickly, um, but not all of them are there yet. So a lot of times, it's, it's a lot of times patients who bring up the, I want this done, then this testing comes up and they, they shrug their shoulders and say, I don't know what the heck to do with this. And that's why my, my clinic is always busy because I get a lot of those referrals afterwards of saying, well, help me interpret this information. And so, as I had mentioned, this is why we don't know a whole heck of a lot. We are now understanding what the range of normal looks like, all right? So we're, we're, we're trying to recognize, you know, what's left-handedness, right? Left-handedness is a difference. It's not a problem although some might argue it is a bit of a problem. Point is, is that it's different and it's not a problem in the same way that this causes epilepsy kind of thing. Um, new genes get discovered all the time. And we're also discovering what normal looks like in these epilepsy genes all the time. And so it's actually almost as harrowing to go from, we think this is a problem to this actually isn't a problem when, when people have been now been giving a name to their epilepsy and having this change all, all, uh, uh, all the time. Um, the biggest changes, actually, I'll save this to the very end, talking about um, where I think the future of this is going, just making sure I hit the important stuff first. And actually, okay, I just noticed where my time is, we're good. And so um, this kind of now dovetails into the next question of, should I get genetic testing or should my loved one get genetic testing? What can I actually do with this information? Am I only going to confuse myself and, and confuse my epilepsy provider when they have this information that they don't know what to do with? So... So who should, who's kind of the, the general, like who's the ideal patient for it? Well, anyone who has one of these well-described epilepsy disorders associated with one of these genes probably should get genetic testing for a myriad of different reasons. And selfishly, it's partially because it's going to help not necessarily you, but the generations to come. As one, every single time I get a patient and I can establish their genetic cause, I now know what that gene looks like. I now know what epilepsy relates to that gene looks like a little bit better. So the next time I get that next patient, it's going to be, it's going to help me understand them better. Um, and so anyone who fits any of the known patterns, which is changing all the time, should get tested for that reason alone. Now, obviously it's impossible for anyone, myself included, and this is my specialty, to know what the description of every single one of those is. And so I try to then parse it down a little bit easier. It's almost easier to say who shouldn't be tested. Well, um, the easier, I, I tell this story um, just because, just to, to recognize how challenging it is to answer this question. Um, if a different cause has been proven, usually you don't necessarily need to go genetic testing. And I say that having had a, an individual, I won't share gender or age, so I don't uh, violate their HIPAA, uh, rights, who had two clear reasons, undeniable, these are very high risk reasons for epilepsy, and they were having hard to control seizures. And I was making the comment of, you know, this is not acting the way this, 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 these particular types of epilepsy usually behave, and just kind of, but I was like, you know, it's two, right? That's why it's just, it's two different things. This is why it's a little bit harder. Well, lo and behold, after taking care of them for a couple of years, they, they comment, oh, one of my cousins also has epilepsy and their dad has epilepsy. And I'm like, oh no, did I, did I 
not get genetic testing when I should be thinking of this. And sure enough, they had a third reason for their seizures. And so there is none of this is hard and fast in terms of you shouldn't. And every time I give this lecture, I wind up having to scratch something off because it used to be if you have an abnormal MRI, this adds nothing. Well, it actually might add something because now we, we now know for a number of these genes that they can have certain specific abnormalities on their MRI. It depends on the abnormality though on the MRI that we're seeing. The most common abnormality is mesial temporal sclerosis. That one is not high yield. That is one that specifically we don't typically need to do genetic testing for with a few exceptions. And that'll pretty much apply to everything I'm about to say. If your seizures are under good control, typically genetic testing is not gonna add a whole lot for you or for your loved one. Um, I make that caveat because again, it does help me. It does help future generations of epilepsy patients because if you are doing well and I can figure out a cause for your epilepsy, then the next time I have a patient with your mutation, I now can share this positive story of not everyone who has this gene does poorly. Because right now that's one of our big struggles is we're testing mostly people who are not doing well. And so whenever patients hear about these disorders, they're like, oh my God, all these kids are really sick. And I have to specifically say, well, no, that's, that's the ones on the internet. Those are the ones that we've known about for a while. We're discovering more and more that there are people who are mildly affected who have these same genetic changes. I really don't like testing febrile seizures only. Um, this, this line is creeping and creeping and creeping where again, it used to be no one would order genetic testing. And now everyone is ordering for, for people who only have febrile seizures or have just borderline, you know, they've had their fourth febrile seizure or was a 15 minute febrile seizure, just slightly out of range for a typical febrile seizure. And lo and behold, they're finding mutations in these genes and they're saying, uh oh, now you have Dravet syndrome. Now you have these, uh, these very dangerous epilepsy syndromes where that's not quite what our epilepsy testing is quite prepared to, to, to do yet. And so um, if it's me ordering it where I'm prepared to, to say, don't be scared by these results, it's one thing. But for the most part, I'm getting a lot, a lot, a lot of referrals from other doctors for kids who are doing just fine, who have these very scary changes on their uh, genetic testing, where I think it unnecessarily scared everyone, the provider included. And so I'm very hesitant to do febrile seizures because a lot of the genes that come up for febrile seizures only overlap with some very scary epilepsy syndromes. Um, certain epilepsy syndromes, and this is really interesting in that uh, you'll still see, uh, see this classified by the International League Against Epilepsy as the genetic generalized epilepsies, which um, all of the ones that, that make sense if we scientifically think of them as genetic, we know that they run in families but it turns out when we test their genes, we can't find any genes that are actually causing them. And so these are some very typical ones like juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, uh, childhood or juvenile absence epilepsy, benign Rolandic epilepsy. When we test them, we're not finding any genes whatsoever that are causing them. That doesn't mean it's not genetic, as I had just previously mentioned, right? It's in the gene somewhere because it's running in families, but we can't find them yet, even as we're doing all this complicated testing. Um, it's funny because every single time I give this lecture, I have to delete another one off the list. Jevin syndrome, we now have two different genes that we know can cause Jevin syndrome. Um, and so the list keeps, keeps evolving on who shouldn't be there. But the JME, child, uh, CAE, and JAE, those three still to this day, we're not finding any genes that cause them. And so the shorthand for who should be tested is unexplained refractory epilepsy. These are the people where we might actually get some clear benefits or some clear opportunities or some clear explanations. Um, that's kind of the easiest shorthand version of who should be tested. Um, I, we are discovering, getting into the more scientific answer, epilepsy plus. And so what I mean by that is particularly epilepsy plus intellectual disability or epilepsy plus autism. Um, epilepsy plus any rare genetic disorder, like so like a cleft lip, cleft palate, um, horseshoe kidney, anything that's kind of a quirky, this something different genetically happened here. These are people that I would generally more, more likely to think of getting genetic testing done. Um, seizures under the age of two, particularly with a normal MRI. Uh, so normal MRI, seizures at, under the age of two, the yield of genetic testing is actually about 50% of the time we can find a cause there. 
And so that, those are the, 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 the people that I'm most driven to get testing done. And that's also the whole reason that testing is free in that age group, because it's most likely to find some of these abnormalities. There are specific epilepsy syndromes that we know are way more likely to find a, an explanation for. Um, and for most of these, uh, if you're attending this, your providers probably know this because these are all relatively well-known ones. West syndrome is the other, that's like infantile spasms, if that means anything to uh, people in this audience. Gervais syndrome, again, if you've been diagnosed with Gervais syndrome, I guarantee you that your provider has thought genetic testing. Um, the one that you may not have thought, they might not have thought of is genetic epilepsy with febrile seizures plus, that's G-E-F-S plus. That's when you have fam first degree family members, both with epilepsy and others with febrile seizures. So if you have both febrile seizures and epilepsy running in the family, these are actually very high yield uh, for, for doing genetic testing and finding an explanation. As I had mentioned, seizures, that they run in the family, clearly there seems to be a genetic cause. Doesn't mean we can find it, but it certainly means that it's more likely we're going to find something. And one of the more common referrals is if, I'm, if you're thinking about having children or you're having more children, this still doesn't, to this day, it doesn't really change anything um, for the most part, but it's at least a worthwhile conversation either with me or with a genetic counselor to say, is it worth knowing ahead of time? Because at this point, there is not a single gene that we know about where we're going to do something before their first seizure. All right. So let's just say that it does run in the family and we can figure that out. I would not recommend testing your child until they ultimately wind up having a test. Uh, so they, until they ultimately wind up having a seizure, then we would do genetic testing. Because again, I wouldn't recommend any treatment before then. The only caveat there is tuberous sclerosis. Tuberous sclerosis is the only disease that we are starting to treat before the first signs of it. But there are other signs besides seizures that we look for in tuberous sclerosis. So again, you'll notice the recurrent theme of me hedging and keep saying over and over again, it depends. There are certain exceptions. It's really hard for me to kind of give hard and fast rules across the board. Um, you know, we talked about, you know, who should get testing. Is there any reason why we shouldn't do it? And again, as long as your provider is very comfortable in talking about these, um, these results, then there really isn't a downside. But again, most particularly older providers are uncomfortable in doing the interpretation. Um, and and it's, I, I understand why. It's, it's like getting the, uh, the terms of service and all the stuff you sign up online. The results that we get are huge. And if you haven't done this a lot, it can be very, very intimidating to slog through that. And, and not everyone is prepared to, to answer that. Again, that's, that's why I wind up seeing a lot of these patients. Um, again, the, uh, if you're doing whole genome or whole exome, you're not just sequencing um, genetic genes. You're, you're sequencing things like uh, BRCA. So that is the breast cancer gene, where you may or may not want to know about that, that risk running in your family. Lots of people do, not everyone does. You may find out that you have early onset um, dementia that runs in the family. They, uh, if you're doing these tests, I do recommend you do them with a genetic counselor. This is not something that should be done by your neurologist, not even I do them. And again, this is my specialty, um, primarily because uh, there are certain things that I'm just not prepared to talk about. Um, what, it winds up, what they wind up doing for a lot of these tests is they specifically ask you, if we find out we're testing these genes that might have an implication of an early onset disease that we can't do anything about, do you want to know these results? And you have the decision, you get the, to make that decision. And there's often a, a counseling period you go through with your genetic counselor. I, I'm not prepared to talk about that just because it's just not my area of expertise. But there are things like Huntington's disease where it is a devastating condition, a dementia, uh, dementing kind of condition that um, would shorten life, but there's nothing that we can do about early. And not everyone would want to know that ahead of time. I, I know I probably wouldn't. <laughs> So now again, let's talk about, you know, this is, this is where I think we might find an answer. Now, what do we do with that answer? Now, um, we mostly do it because we're trying to kind of anticipate the future a little bit. And I'm sure everyone, if you, if you have epilepsy or one of your patients, uh, or sorry, one of your loved ones has epilepsy, um, I'm sure you've been told at least once one of your providers, I'm not sure what the future holds. Uh, my metaphor is always my crystal ball is broken. Um, we have lots of ideas. Our science can give us ideas of percentages, what's likely to happen. Um, but overall, we're unfortunately doing just very educated guesses. And so what helps with us with our genetic testing is that even if I still can't tell you for sure what the risk is, I can at least talk to you about certain things that are more likely to happen. Um, 
I, I, I personally don't really like, I, I don't find it satisfying to have this conversation that certain things have a high risk of SUDEP. So SCN1A and SCN8A are the ones that I know are, um, are the ones that we know are much higher risk of SUDEP. And for those in the audience who are not familiar, that sudden unexpected death in an epilepsy patient. Um, I don't like having that conversation because um, I'm already doing everything I can to mitigate the risk of SUDEP. And what do I mean by that? I'm already working to do everything to, to reduce seizure burden, to be on as few medications as possible, um, and to make, and ensure that we're all, that we have as few side effects as possible on our medications. And those are all the things that we know are the best things we can do to reduce risk of SUDEP. Um, if I'm starting to talk about how this, for SCN1A, for example, this is a hard to control epilepsy disorder. Hey, now I also have to say there's a 10 times risk of passing away related to epilepsy. I, I if I was, you know, if that was my kid, I, that would be devastating information for me, unless you can finish up with well, what can I do to prevent that? And so I, I will say it feels for me as a provider, it's a very uncomfortable conversation. And this is why the Epilepsy Foundation often coaches us into saying, no, we have to talk about it because we hate talking about it. <laughs> I will say when I had those conversations, most patients really seem to appreciate them. Even if, again, there's not a whole lot different, just, just being aware, it's just putting it out there of saying, you know, we're aware that these are not great. And yes, we know that this is a risk. And at least we can talk about mathematically what we know that risk to be, because it is a very low risk, but it is a possibility. Um, I find it much more useful for other things like, again, risk of a movement disorder. What do I mean by that? Um, basically, not every abnormal involuntary movement is a seizure. All right, so ticks are probably the most um, common example of a movement disorder that isn't under full control, um, but is not fully voluntary. And a lot of times, especially in kids, it's at first getting mistaken as, oh no, there's a new involuntary movement, this is a new seizure. However, if I have a uh, condition like uh, um, uh, GLUT1 deficiency, which is SLC2A1, or uh, another one, PRRT2, uh, these genes that we know that they're likely to develop these weird movements that are not seizure, that is incredibly helpful as a parent to say, hey, be on the lookout for this. These aren't dangerous. They're not seizures. Let me know when they happen and we'll talk about what we can do about them. That I find to be a much more helpful kind of conversation. Uh, there's another disorder, GRIN2A, uh, where we know that they are far, far, far more likely to have these problems, uh, this rare problem called ESIS, electrographic status epilepticus in sleep, something that we see in less than 1% of epilepsy patients, but close to 50% of these kids with GRIN2A. Just happened to me just a couple of months ago where I had a patient where I knew they had grin 2 way. As soon as they said they were having troubles in school, it's get into an EEG right now. I'm pretty sure I know what this is. And sure enough, that's exactly what it was. Whereas ordinarily, again, uh, so what that normally would look like is school difficulties. And there are a million reasons for school difficulties, especially right now, given our changing education and pandemic and anxiety all and medication changes, all these explanations. And for, for me as a provider and for family to be aware that, hey, we might see difficulties that we're gonna be treating with our seizure medications to be on the lookout for that. Again, it's going to, to reduce the amount of time it takes to make such a hard diagnosis. Um, knowing, I think that, that, that people have probably experienced this, that, that we know that, that people with epilepsy often have comorbid difficulties, often with behavior, uh, often psychiatric challenges, um, that kind of just go hand in hand with all the changes that go along with epilepsy and our medications. It is very, very helpful to hear that your kid or you have a mutation and every other person that has the same mutation is struggling with mood and behavior. It means you're not alone. It means that this isn't necessarily a personality problem. This is the disease. And, you know, we can say that to we're blue in the face that, yes, we know that people with epilepsy have a have a fourfold greater risk of anxiety compared to the general population. Again, that, that sounds great and all. It's another thing to say people with my epilepsy disorder all suffer from anxiety, depression, uh, uh, aggression, all those types of things. That makes a world of difference in making everyone more comfortable, I think, in, in explaining those and, and feeling less stigmatized. Um, for others, we know that for like frontal lobe epilepsy, some of these seizures are showing up at puberty. And it's very scary when a new seizure type uh, emerges and just knowing ahead of time to say, look, for this type of this gene, we often see new ones come in at puberty. These are what they look like. Let me know when you see them. Far, far less scary when they do emerge years later. Um, 
I also find it helpful for a number of these genes that we know are, are either really only a problem when you're an infant um, versus others that we know they're more of a problem when you're an infant and uh, others where we know that when, when one seizure comes through, it opens up the door to a dozen others and then the rest of the seizures, everything is gonna be not, not as big of a problem. And so when I know that it's only infancy that's a problem, then we, you know, it's the conversation of, okay, we need to be hard and aggressive now, but we can potentially back off later. That information, again, for, for parents usually is very, very comforting. Um, just knowing that we're in the hard time now and that things will settle out most likely, again, is really helpful. And for ones that occur in clusters, it's a reminder to say, we're gonna have good cluster treatment potentially, but we're gonna avoid being on seven medications the rest of the time because I don't need seven medications every day. I might need them during the clusters. And that kind of helps reduce uh, all the side effects from the medications potentially. Uh, there are, for all of these genes, we are now getting to the point that we are getting more and more targeted therapies in terms of there are some medications that work better than others. I'm getting short on time, so I'm not gonna read everything off on this list, but this is the, this is the current direction that we're generally going. There are 27 different seizure medications, sorry, now 28, because there was another one that was approved last week. Uh, there are 28 different seizure medications that we can use. And if we know there are some that work better for certain genetic disorders, that we are more likely to then go to that medication in the list. We are now also at the point where there are specific medications we use for specific genetic disorders. And this list grows every single time I give this, this lecture. So, um, for, so the Dravet ones all get lumped together. There are about 10 different genes that cause Dravet syndrome, including ones that we can't find genetically. And there are three specific medications that we use for that. Now those medications, two of them are used in other conditions besides uh, Dravet syndrome. Um, for our frontal lobe epilepsies, uh, our nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, believe it or not, they use nicotine in some series to treat it. I have never done this. Um, it seems a little bit, uh, not doesn't feel good, but the, the, that again, only used for those certain genetic disorders. Um, I, again, the one I just wanna highlight is ganaloxone was literally approved last week or the week before for CDKL5 and is the very first um, uh, epilepsy drug approved for CDKL5. And, and so this list grows every single time I give it. Again, there's 300 of them. I'm hoping that over the years, we'll have specific ones for all of them. Now, these are kind of more hokey, kind of like pie in the sky. But for every single patient that I give a diagnosis to, this is the number one reason that they appreciate it. That I, I love the Epilepsy Foundation. I'm here talking to the Epilepsy Foundation. They do amazing, amazing work. But they represent everyone with epilepsy. And so that's going to take it from the, I'm having dozens of seizures every single day, um, and I have severe intellectual disability from the, I have one seizure a year, or I don't have any seizures and I'm just on medication. Not everyone looks the same well, uh, under that umbrella. When you have a specific genetic disorder, you're discovering a much, much, much smaller community of people who look the same or look very, very similar. And I can tell you for dealing with a lot of these disorders where there's sometimes only 10 people on the entire planet that have the same one, finding those other nine people and talking about their struggles is immensely therapeutic for these parents. And it's also helpful for me as an epilepsy provider, because again, there's 300, 300 of these genes. Most of these genes have multiple things that they don't just look like one thing. When these parents then say, I just, you know, we're dealing with this struggle. I'm talking to this mom online. She did the exact same thing with her kid. This is what they figured out years later. Can we try it? And nine times out of 10, my answer is, of course we can. Because I, I, I've never seen, again, you're one of 10. I've never seen another one exactly like you. Let's work together and figure out what, what we can learn here. This list is growing all the time, where for, thankfully for most of these, I have multiple patients where I can apply my own personal experience. But even without that, just having that, that community is, again, you guys are here because you recognize the value of the Epilepsy Foundation community. This is also another piece of it where, these, where again, universally, they really, really appreciate that, that, that connection. Uh, I, I think I'll go, actually, perfect timing. I have four minutes left. So I always like to hypothesize and just kind of create uh, guesses as to what the future is going to look like when it comes to genetic testing. Now, we already know that testing is gonna get cheaper. And again, because just was following Moore's law, the cost of actually running all the letters is going to approach, but not completely hit, zero dollars. 
Um, it's going to be the human aspect. The interpretation is going to get more challenging, but the more data we have, the cheaper that's going to get. Now, it's kind of our standard approach now for, uh, for new onset epilepsy to get an EEG and an MRI. We're going to be at the point where doing a genome is going to be cheaper than doing an MRI. And so I'm guessing that in the not too distant future, we're going to be doing this like that for every single patient that has epilepsy. I, I'm guessing we're probably much further away from that than most people think. I'm guessing probably 15 to 20 years before it's, it's really ready for that. Um, but I'm guessing we're not, that, that it's, it's, I will say, I actually will say I'm positive it's coming. It's just a matter of time. Um, the, the actual sequencing, as I mentioned, the turnaround time is now down to around six weeks. Uh, there's a lab in San Diego that it takes longer to get the blood there than it does to actually run the test. And so they can get it done in 24 hours. And so again, these are going to get done faster and, and much, very much, much faster. Um, as I mentioned, it's going to be done much earlier in our algorithm. And at some point, we're going to be able to predict more intelligently than just doing the EEG of saying, what's the likelihood? And when you've had one seizure, what's the likelihood of having another one? Um, custom tailored seizure medication selection. That's what I was talking about earlier of saying, you have a KCNQ2 mutation. These are the top five medications that seem to work for that. And then going from, from that approach. Uh, I, I will also predict that in the future that we're going to wind up actually not just saying KCNQ2, we're going to say we're going to have a KCNQ2 mutation in this part of that, of that gene because they seem to respond to certain classes of this medications and this one responds to other classes. The last one, which I think is the most interesting, is the custom tailored non-seizure medications. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, there are now people, uh, some labs that are willing to take the mutations of individual patients and model them. They will actually do it for you. Well, they will, they will generate zebrafish that have the exact mutation that, that you or your child has. And then they will then figure out exactly what that change does in terms of the change in the electron, uh, electron in the, the neuronal excitability. And then they will apply every single molecule that is known to cross the blood brain barrier and ask which one fixes it. And um, for the most part, we're not, this is not, it's, it's insanely expensive right now. So this is not something we're doing uh, with any kind of regularity, but they have already shown there are some things like there are some people that seem to have had their um, epilepsy affected by antidepressants because antidepressants cross the blood brain barrier and uh, they do bond, bind to receptors in the brain. And we were just surprised to discover that they actually can work in specific mutations for specific types of epilepsy. And so I think that's something we're gonna be doing in the future too. So that brings me exactly to time. And so we'll hopefully have some time for some questions. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Smith. I know I wrote down lots of questions, but I will hold mine. I will encourage people to use the Q&A um, and, and submit your questions. If we can't get to all of them, we can still capture them. And, and if Dr. Smith is open to it, we could send them to him and he could provide some written responses too. Um, but I do know we had one question in the Q&A. So is Vimpat and Onfi a common medication combination? All right, well, that's a little bit cheating because that is not, not, not related to genetics. And, but yes, that is a commonly used medication combination. Uh, they, they have no significant interactions between the two of them. I don't use them too much together because Vimpat's one of the best focal epilepsy drugs and Onfi is one of the best generalized epilepsy drugs. Um, but I do have patients who are on both because Onfi often does work for focal and Vimpat often works for generalized. Great, thank you. Uh, so, and then we did have one submitted in the chat. So um, uh, somebody asked, so genetic panel testing for epilepsy with autism is a good idea, question mark. My 19 year old has had his first seizure two years ago. Um, and then I would maybe add, if there is a family where one child has epilepsy and one maybe has autism, would you suggest to that family to do genetic testing? Fantastic questions. These are actually right on the gray zone, actually, of who should or should not. So the earlier onset, uh, the more likely. 17 is an older age of onset. Um, and so it's actually 18 is where, if you have an onset after the age of 18, where the, ri the rate of finding something is about 1%. So if we combine those two factors of the, the likelihood, the, the all comers, if we tap everyone that we have tested and published, I should say, with autism plus epilepsy, the rate of finding a mutation is around, uh, around 30%. So we got to subtract some of them again, saying that, that, let's just bear in mind that most of them have probably had epilepsy onset earlier. I would say it's probably about a 10% chance we would find something. And uh, again, if that is a $100, $200 test, that personally, I think it'd be worth it. 
Um, it's, it's a matter of, again, is this going to wind up uh, costing anything? Um, that, that to me is probably the biggest, again, as I said, the biggest downside is, is uh, the risk of cost. The other downside is that if you're 19 years old, you're probably seeing an adult epileptologist. Adult epileptologists are not comfortable at all with genetic testing yet, simply because they don't need to be. This is very complicated. And again, onset after the age of 18, the yield is very, very low. And so very rarely are they finding anything. So um, a lot of times I get referrals to my clinic. A lot of them are from adult providers just because this is just not a technology that they are comfortable or familiar with yet. You're still, still muted, Jenna. Thank you. Um, so another question did come in. Uh, are there any new non-pharmacological, I can't even talk right now, treatment for rare epilepsies? So for all of these, it depends. Um, there, for non-pharmacological, I'm trying to just run my list. Um, I guess it depends what you call non-pharmacological. Uh, triheptanoin is a, uh, a specific medium chain triglyceride. Um, and so by that, it's kind of like, it's not a fair comparison, but kind of think of more like, like coconut oil, like a polyunsaturated fat, um, that we, that we are using in specific treatment for, for GLUT1 deficiency. Um, it is obviously a pharmaceutical grade when we wind up using it, but it is not what you, people would traditionally think of. It's, it's actually a metabolic, um, treatment, um, for other metabolic disorders where we're, we are treating metabolically. And so we're actually not treating the epilepsy, we're treating the metabolic abnormality that results in seizures. Um, and so those are really kind of more nutritional supplements specific to those specific, um, those specific disorders. Great, thank you. And I'm sorry, I was having a little bit of connectivity issues there, but I think I'm good now. Uh, so I'm not seeing any other questions in the Q&A. Uh, so I will uh, wrap us up here and thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Uh, my last question for you would just be, you know, if, if there are people on this call or who listen to this webinar later who are interested in going down this route of doing genetic testing, what would be the next steps that they would take? Who would they contact? Um, what, what, what would they do? I always recommend getting started with your neurologist or epilepsy doctor. Um, they already know you the best and um, they, it's, it's often, even for me sometimes where it's just an, oh yeah, I can't believe we haven't gotten this done yet. Um, and, and so always start there. If they are not comfortable, um, I, I, I do see patients specifically for genetic testing. Uh, obviously you'd have to be willing to come see me in Minnesota. I know that our reach is considerably beyond uh, that here. Um, unfortunately, it's still, all this has to be ordered by your doctor. This is not something that can be uh, done on your own, unfortunately at this time. Uh, I, I, I haven't done that uh, $300 uh, Facebook one. And so I can't attest to the quality of, of that one. Um, and so I don't know if we can get some of the answers there. Um, but I, I, that's why I would just say, it's just easier to get started with your epilepsy doctor. And if they're not comfortable, you know, push them a little bit and say, well, then who is? Can you get me to a genetic counselor? Uh, are there anyone else you, in your practice that would be willing to do it? You know, just to challenge them a little bit. And for the most part, I mean, most doctors are aware that this is a, new and evolving thing. And, and they, most of them should have an answer. Uh, and so you should be able to get some kind of direction from, from your provider. Great. Okay. Do we have time for one last question? I got time. Okay. Um, so one more came in. So uh, really quick, you mentioned metabolic ab abnormalities. Is that a whole panel in and itself in genetic testing? It used to be. Um, it actually, we still, in, in, one, in people where we highly suspect metabolic disorder, um, we are doing both the genetic testing and we are testing the metabolic pathways. Um, and there are multiple reasons for that. Uh, the bottom line now is that they're actually testing pretty much all of them with our genetic testing. And uh, what used to be a very commonly done test where we would actually test the cerebral spinal fluid, where we actually have to do a spinal tap looking specifically for the, um, the amount of neurotransmitters. Those are like the amount of serotonin, um, uh, GABA, you know, the things you probably heard about in some of these other lectures, um, where actually our genetic testing is almost as good as that in terms of finding these abnormalities. So they're, mm -hmm. they're included on the vast majority of these panels. I still, in people where I'm, I'm worried about it, I don't count on it. I do both still. 
Um, but for the most part, genetic testing has already replaced, I would estimate probably about 90% of those taps. Um, again, thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Thank you for taking the time to join us for all of the wonderful information. I think I might have to follow up with you with some questions of my own, because uh, just lots and lots of really, really amazing um, information. All Thanks right. For having me. Always, always enjoy these conversations. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great night, everyone.